This is the legend of a man named Byron. Byron was the oldest of five children and grew up with sport from a very young age. Having first grown up in the United States, Byron found a passion in the sport of swimming. He would find great success in his early days swimming at the university level, while simultaneously excelling in school as an All-American for all three years of American varsity competition and as an All-Canadian during his time in Canadian varsity competition. Byron's potential was immense, and this potential would become important later on. That's because one day something incredible happened. Something that changed Byron's life forever. Something that would define his career forever. Because of Byron's excellent achievements, Byron found himself competing for Canada at various international competitions, such as the Pan Am Games, the British Commonwealth Games, the World Aquatics Championships, and even the Olympic Games. In total, Byron would win six medals at these international games. It doesn't stop there. Immediately upon retiring from competing in swimming events, Byron moved into the world of coaching. Since 1976, Byron has become the most decorated coach in Canadian university history in any sport, having won 59 conference championships and 20 national championship titles. Most importantly, Byron is the coach of Olympic bronze medalist and world champion swimmer Kylie Moss, and Byron has been the longtime color commentator for CBC Olympics for all swimming events, including Michael Phelps's eight gold medal run at the 2008 Olympics. An accomplished swimmer, expert coach, and a walking encyclopedia of competitive swimming, Byron has helped write the stories of many swimmers. Today, it is time to tell his story, his adventures, his legend. This is the legend of Byron McDonald. Byron, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for those nice words. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start from the very, very beginning. What inspired you to pursue swimming? Well, actually, um, I was inspired not by the fact that I wanted to swim. I was inspired because I actually had a, um, I guess you'd call it a disease when I was young. It's called Perthes disease, and it's where the, the bones don't grow properly. The hip wasn't moving properly, um, you know, with, with my thigh and uh, the leg bones. And so they put me in a cast for a year and a half. And uh, grade one, I think it was, kindergarten grade one, um, and so when I came out of that, the doctor recommended that I swim as opposed to running or anything else to get my legs strong. Because obviously, if you think about it, the amount of atrophy in a leg that's been in a cast for over a year is pretty significant. So, so that was the age of, I guess, seven, maybe. Um, I took up swimming. My mom and dad, I, don't, I never saw my mom once in the water. I don't even know if she knew how to swim. Um, and my dad was more like a track guy when he was in high school, which I found out many, many years later, and a football guy. So, so really, it wasn't in the family at all. I think it was the only reason I went into swimming was because the doctor told me I was supposed to do it. So, and then I ended up actually taking to it right away and being pretty good at it right off the bat, learned very quickly, and then joined the local YMCA program and was pretty good in that. And from then, just kind of got good coaches and... and um, had a bit of natural talent and they just took it to the next level. So it worked. Yeah, it certainly worked out. And my next question was in regards to your university career as you started at the University of Michigan in the 70s. So when you started started rather swimming at the high school level and you started competing and started getting really good at it, I mean, I would assume that there will be a pretty big jump between high school competition and university level competition. So what was the swimming scene like back in the 1970s and what extent is it the same or different from today's university swimming scene ah okay fairly all-encompassing question um it was uh i mean i was a bit prepared for the university swimming scene i mean it was a very you know it, obviously it's a it's a very high level there's lots of olympians and everything involved even back at that level or that that time of year that time of um century um but the high school program, my parents were very lucky. In the United States, different than Canada. In the United States, you can only go to the high school where you live in those boundaries. 
um, sort of a catchment area, if you want to call it. I mean, we have some of those here in Canada, but usually you can still lobby to go to another one or different people can go to one. Not in the United States. You've got to go to the high school where you live. And my parents, without knowing it, bought a house where it turned out that the high school was the number one high school swimming team in the United States. So pure bonus, um, pure luck. Um, they went there because it was a very good academic school, but they had no concept of swimming. So so because of that, the coaches, both in the Hall of Fame um, from that team, uh, was, as I said, the number one high school in the United States. So I was able to get a very good upbringing in the sport of swimming. And I progressed my career very well to the point where I was one of the top guys out of grade 12 in the United States. So had a had a pretty reasonable choice of schools to go to and decided that I wanted one that was really good academics and also had a really good swim team. And also I didn't want to go all the way to the West Coast. So I decided University of Michigan because it's great academically and they were, I think, third or fourth in the NCAA uh, swimming championship. So I knew they had a good team and, and I was even more specific on that actually. And so I decided I'm a butterflyer. I should go to a school where they have a history of success in that, spro- in that stroke. And there were three guys in the top, in the finals, in the A finals uh, on the previous university championships from the University of Michigan. So I thought, this guy must know how to coach butterfly. So that's what I want to do. So I chose to go there. So what's different now versus back uh, back then? Uh, believe it or not, and, and the swimmers today would laugh at this, uh, um, we did not have organized morning workouts. Um, now swimmers are so used to going twice a day and training you know, early mornings, et cetera. There were no morning workouts. As a matter of fact, in grade 12, I went to the coach and said, and of course there was no internet or anything, news filtered across very slowly across the country. I said, I understand the people and the kids in California are swimming in the morning, so doing twice a day. Don't you think we should do that? And the coach looked at me like I was from Mars and said, uh, no, I don't think we should do that. Um, if you're really keen, pool's open, make sure you come with a friend, but I'm not coming. So me and my friend Joe Kaplan, we actually showed up three mornings a week. Now, later than the 6 a.m. the kids do now, um, because they had to do it before school, we went to the school pool. And we swam from um, 7.45 to 8.45, and then classes started at 9. So, in essence, we we were a little bit ahead of the curve then. Now it's fait accompli. If you want to be an elite swimmer, you're going to swim mornings and nights. Not every day, twice a day, but but enough days that it's going to add up. Even when I was in university, there were no organized workouts in the mornings, right? That has, that's a, there's, a, there's a gigantic shift probably in the 80s, I would say, and certainly by the 90s where – there were many, many, you know, you weren't just swimming five days a week, uh, five sessions a week. You were swimming more like eight, nine, or even 10 for some kids. And with that also became a lot more strength training. Strength training about probably came in vogue in the 80s or 90s. Um, again, wasn't around in the 60s and 70s at all, at any level. Um, maybe a little bit of dry land stuff, but nothing really at that level. So so there was there were many things that have changed currently now versus then. There's more intensity in the training. Um, uh, it's longer training. It used to be an hour, hour and a half. Now it's two hours often. Um, and there's more competition. Um, you know, you used to compete very locally. People didn't have the money to travel cross country and do all those kind of things that they do now. Now you don't even hesitate. If there's a really big meet and you're an elite athlete, you decide, well, I'm going to go down to LA for that meet. I'm going to go. I've sent, I've sent swim, swimmers to Europe to compete. So um, the world has shrunk. And because of that also, because of the internet, you also know who your competitors are. Um, when I was swimming in high school and even university, you kind of knew who they were, but you weren't really sure. Uh, you didn't really know until you showed up on the deck who was going to be there at the championships. Well, now you know you know what people are doing. Of course, I mean, I don't do social media, but a lot of people do, and they know, you know, on Instagram they follow some of the best swimmers. So there's a, there's a bigger awareness of what's going on, and there's a, a, a lot more training going on. I guess I'll spend another 10 seconds and say there's better facilities. There were no 50 meter indoor pools in North America, hardly. I could probably count them on one hand. Now every big program has got an indoor 50 meter pool, so you can train in the long course as well as the short course. Got weight room access, you've got nutritionists, you've got sports. It's just, it's professionalized to a final, final high level. All right? And finally, what I'll, I'll close this comment on is my coach at the university at the time, I said, you know, Canadian swimming doesn't really have any a lot of elite swimmers at this particular moment in the 70s. And he said, Byron, swimming in Canada will take off when a coach can earn his living coaching swimming and just coaching, not having to run the pool, not having to do other things, but coaching swimming. 
because that's what we're doing here in the United States. And we have a lot of very good professionalized coaches. And he was right. Um, because the Olympics in 76 were in Montreal, all of a sudden there was a professionalism in the coaching ranks and people wanted to be coaches. Nobody wanted to be coached before that because it really it was a part-time gig. And you had to do something else as well. But it started to get professionalized. And now there are good coaches in Canada. There's coaches all over the world. And my final comment on it is in the 76 Olympics, there were nine, I think it was nine countries that shared all the medals. And nowadays there's 20 to 25 countries that share the medals at the Olympic Games. Well, you don't do that by luck. You've got to have coaches. You've got to have all the other things I was talking about. So it's way, way more professionalized at the coaching level, at the swimmer level. And that's been a big change. And eventually we'll talk about the fact that swimmers now swim eight till they're older as well. They don't sort of just swim one quadrennial and retire at age 20. Yeah, and that's fascinating to hear that back in your day, there weren't really any formalized morning workouts because when I started covering university sport back when I was in university, this would have been the mid-2010s, it's pretty much bread and butter at that point in time. It became part of the culture. It became expected for that. And that really shows to how both the general knowledge within high-level sport has evolved and also how the performance of athletes have evolved as well. I mean, I can assume that your eagerness to train in the mornings two or three times a week in the mornings, yeah, in the mornings, that would certainly have been an important factor for boosting your performance and getting you ahead of the curve and being that high achieving compared to similar elite athletes of the time. I I mean, that's my initial assumption. It would have done wonders for you. And it did. There's no question it did. All right. I mean, I I was coaching myself, obviously, because the coach didn't want to come up, want to show up. But um, uh, and even at even a university, the coach said, you guys, the pool's here. Nobody else is using it, which is another advantage of a a lot of the university programs, um, particularly in the U.S., is that they have a pool just for the varsity team. So it's open all the time. So he said, I want you guys to show up and swim in the morning three days a week. And myself and my my roommate at the time, Stu Isaac, we would go in and swim. And we were about the only ones on the team that did. So, and again, it was, it was the added bonus. And it just, I, I would argue very strongly that it did give me that little extra edge and, and gave me a, a, a heads up on some of my other competitors. And it also, once you're starting to commit at that level, you're committing even then for the other workout, just, you know, the afternoon workouts, you know, you're already vested. You're already committed to the mornings and that. So you're already into the sport at a higher level, or you're at least thinking higher level. So you're going to work even harder in the training sessions that you have. And, you know, and then you're also going to train all year round. You're going to train all summer, which, again, in the 60s, kids didn't do that often. By the 70s, they started to. And now it's it's accepted if you want to be a lead athlete. You're obviously, you know, going to, to train year round. Yeah. So what was your daily life like? So you mentioned morning at workouts, afternoon workouts. What was your daily life back then as a competitive university swimmer? Eat, sleep, study, sleep. <laughs> I swim. And I eat, I'm missing swimming there, right? So basically, you're up, you have a bite to eat, you go to morning workout. If, you know, in the days that I was doing morning workouts, you go to class, you obviously have lunch, you have a class, workout again in the afternoon, you have dinner, then you study for a while, and then you go to bed, all right? I mean, it's not... It's not the most glorious routine in the world. Um, yes, you do on Friday or Saturday night, try to go out with your buddies or whatever, but there isn't a lot of wild stuff that goes on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because you got to have a little more energy to, to be able to get up in the morning. Now, it was easier for me because I was getting up for a 9 a.m. workout. Nowadays, my athletes that I coach, you know, they're cutting up for a 6.30 morning workout, so they're waking up at 5.30, 5.45. You're definitely not going out in, on the town uh, the night before a morning workout when that's the case. So there's there's more professionalism now in the sense of that you've really got to weigh in pretty heavily. And the, the other disadvantage nowadays is and I, I don't know if it's because there's more students in university or what it is, but um, there's very often class conflicts, so you can't train in the afternoon. So now you have to train in the morning. Even if you're only going to go one workout a day or the odd day you're going to go two workouts, you're going to actually spend a lot of them in the mornings now. So um, so it just means you've got to have your day organized pretty well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one massive challenge that every university athlete, every student athlete, especially swimming athletes, will have to face. What were the other challenges that you had to face back in your university swimming career? Um, well, the ongoing challenge always is financial. Um, they had scholarships not back then. They do now, too, as well. All right. But um, I mean, it's a funny story in the sense that 
I, I'm not a big guy, all right? I'm 5'9", all right? On a good day. And um, um, side story to that is that, you know, yes, I finished six of the Olympics and won a lot of medals. When I was in the Olympic final, um, there were only two guys in the top eight in the Olympic final that were over six feet. I can guarantee you right now that there's nobody under six feet. You know, the average height is probably 6'3". So, you know, I'd be giving away a half a foot to anybody if I was competing today. So I'm, I'm just really glad I was competing when I was competing because people were a little bit smaller. Um, and my genetics are such that I think with more food or more whatever, I wasn't going to grow a lot taller, right? So so anyway, so you have financial challenges. But when I graduated high school, I was five foot five or five, five and a half, whatever. And the coach told me point blank to my face. He said, I don't like recruiting small swimmers. You, you're, real, you're a real good swimmer, but I don't know what the upside is. So he wouldn't give me a, a big scholarship. And so for that reason, when I went to university, I actually had to uh, work in fraternity houses cleaning dishes so that I could get my meals for free so I could save some money. Um, and then luckily I worked in high school, so I had enough money to pay for my, my room and board and then my tuition was paid for. So and my parents didn't have any money, so they really couldn't, couldn't help me. So financial challenges were the biggest one back then, um, even in the summers. You know, in the summer when you train, you know, I'd have to go somewhere to train and, and we would get a two bedroom apartment and we put five swimmers into it, you know, um, sharing beds, sharing cots, whatever, just so the rent would be so dirt cheap that we could afford to actually train all summer because you're training so hard. You really didn't have an opportunity to earn very much money. So so financial challenge was were, were probably always the um, biggest ones. Um, you're operating in a little bit of a vacuum. You really didn't know what anybody else was doing. Um, so you just had to sort of trust your coach 100%, which is fine. You have to do that today as well. But there's a little more external stimulation now. Um, you kind of know what it's going to take. You know what other people are doing. You are pretty big vacuum when I was going to school. Um, all the swimmers in the 70s, you really didn't know what was happening. You didn't know what they were doing on the West Coast. You didn't know what they were doing in Florida. You really didn't know what was – you didn't know what they were doing 100 miles away. Um, you know, if they were really doing something special, you'd only find out – Maybe six months later when you went to the big meet and went, oh, Christ, what are these guys, you know, they're doing a new kind of a flip turn. We didn't even know about that. So so that was a bit of a challenge to be up on up on speed on everything that was going on. So, Wow, that's a lot that you had to juggle back then. And especially yeah. especially with all the, it, it, it's still a very early time period. I think many sports, including swimming, of course, but many sports have that similar sort of growing pain when it comes to knowledge back in the 1970s with the the best techniques, the best workouts, the best diet, and even how the human body works the best and moves the best for that specific sport. And based on what you've told me so far, I think athletes nowadays have a massive 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 advantage over even comparing to 30 years ago based on the knowledge that they've gained and the amount of coaching that they've gotten and just the vast amount of resources that's out there for that sport and it helps them break records a lot easier than it did than it was rather back then yeah i mean there's no question i mean obviously you know, coaches are the key. You're not going to get anywhere without a real good coach. And and the coaches now are so much smarter than they were back in the day, right? I mean, they, the coaches back in the day were smart as, a, you know, they were the best coaches at the time and they had the best knowledge, but they didn't have as much knowledge or ability to get the knowledge that the coaches have today. I mean, obviously, the, the good ones were on cutting edge. They were doing certain things that, you know, it's not drastically different now, but it is a little bit different. There's no question. There were certain trends that we experienced uh, at certain points in my career that were, a bit stupid at times, right? And, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, we were the guinea pigs, the athletes. And it was like, oh, yeah, well, okay, we, we tried that. That was pretty stupid. We're not doing that again, right? Whereas coaches today have had the benefit of those 40 years of coaches trying stuff and, and explaining it and saying, yeah, this didn't work. I went to one coach's conference. And you usually go to these conferences, they bring in the best coaches, you know, the ones that have the most success. And, and you get very excited. Oh, kind of listen to this coach. Let's hear what they have to say. And one really good coach got up and he says, you want to know what? You kind of do the same things as I do. Everybody out there in the audience is just, you know what I think you're going to learn from? You're going to learn more from when you make mistakes. So I'm going to spend the next half hour telling you three or four of the biggest mistakes I made. And it was really, really interesting to hear that. More so than, well, this is what I do. I make the kid do this and work out and I make him do this. I make him do that. Whereas this was like insights into sort of the reasoning behind it and why, why we did it and then why it didn't fail, why it didn't work, why it failed. And you know how to change it for the future. So, so you you learn a lot, and definitely nowadays you learn a lot more. Um, the other thing that happened back, you know, back then versus now, I mentioned it briefly before, was there were very few indoor fifty meter pools. 
Um, you know, basically, particularly probably worse in the United States than in Canada. Canada, at one point, I know we had more. I mean, what are we, a tenth the population? We had more 50-meter indoor pools than, Canada, than the entire United States at one point. And and that was because, obviously, all the Sun Belt, the California, Florida, Texas, they don't build indoor 50-meter pools. Um, they just go outdoors. So, um, but compared to the North and all that, they, they didn't have any, right? Now, yes, there's a ton of them, right? But, but back then, there wasn't. So it was a six-lane, 25-yard pool. Well, you can't fit a lot of people into a six-lane, 25-yard pool. So, you know, when you're doing repeats and everything, you're ending up with this almost constant circle of athletes and you're not getting very specific work done and everything because you didn't have the space. So, you know, that's a, that's a big change now too. You've got more space um, and, and you've got, you know, the ability to rehearse long course swimming for the Olympics, et cetera, stuff like that. So, yeah, that's a very, very good examples, very, very good set of examples of how much has changed since then till now. And I'm glad you mentioned the, the the coach that talked about all of his mistakes that he's made, all of the major mistakes that he's made and how he's learned from them, because that's something regardless of any profession or any area of, or any career area that anyone wants to go into. That's one of the biggest and most important things to do is to learn from your own mistakes. And it's almost cliche at this point, but it's so important because that's how you see, especially in the world of swimming, that's how you see great swimmers, distinguish themselves from good swimmers when they're able to pick up or learn from their coaches that where they're not as good where they're doing something wrong or their their technique isn't very very good that's something that i think is such an important thing and helps distinguish the best from the very good so very very good to hear that because that also applies to coaching from from what you've told me as well well yeah and i mean personal example um i coached the first my first two years coaching i was at york university and we had a lot of success i mean it, it was easy because um you know the team really didn't exist much before i got there right i think they were you know 25th out of 25 teams or something in the country so so we moved up right away i recruited a couple of good kids but i also did a lot of good things and, and basically we went to fifth in the country and then third in the country i was coaching the year right all of a sudden in my second year so then i moved down to the university of toronto and then I did a lot of similar stuff, but I tried to do a, a whole bunch of different other things as well with my first year at the University of Toronto. And we ended up miss, losing the national championships by 10 points, and we should have won. And uh, there's no question, back then it used to be swimming and diving together, and and we had no divers. So we actually went into the meet down by 70 points. Uh, it was only a 300-point meet. So obviously we were, we were the better swim team, but we were trying to win the combined title. That's the only way it was given out. So we had to make up those 70 points. And we and we probably would have, but you know, we made I made a couple of coaching mistakes, and one or two of the athletes made some mistakes too. But it was a it was a I learned if we would have won, I might have made those mistakes later, you know. And as it was, it was like that was a, a wide, a really opening, you know, opened my eyes wide and said, "This is painful as hell," and it hurt, it hurt bad to lose that meet. But it was a real good lesson, and I I, I changed a few things, and I think I changed them for the better the following year. And, um, and it was a really, I'm glad I'm kind of in hindsight, not at the time, <laughs> but in hindsight, I was, I was actually glad that we lost that meet. So yeah. for my coaching, it fast tracked me, I think. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, hindsight is 2020 as they say up there. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to your time competing though, as I mentioned in the introduction, you won six medals at international competitions total. So. How did your training change between university meets and international meets, if at all? Yeah, very little. Um, the only reason it changed a, a little bit was that the coach I had at university, and again, this is different then versus now, he didn't want to coach in the summer. He had a nice big sailboat. He wanted to sail like Michigan all summer. So that's what he did. So I had to find another place to train. So, that, so you know, when you go to a different coach, obviously the training is going to change. You know, there's little, you know, little differences, little unique things of each coach. And, um, so I moved out to Philadelphia to train uh, under the, it was the best program in the Eastern United States at the time. Um, and because you're not going to school, we did doubles every day. So we swam 12 times a week. You can't do that. Way. Well, I couldn't anyway do that if I was in school. Because basically then you asked me about my routine. So we trained from 8 to 10 in the morning, which again, there's no school. So you don't have to finish in earlier. And then 4 to 6 at night. So we get up at 7, have a bite to eat, swim 8 to 10, come home, go to bed from 11 to 1.30, get up, relax, go back to the pool at 3.30, be done at 6, have dinner at 7, 
watch TV at nine, go to bed at 10. I mean, it was or, or 11. So it was really, a, you were doing nothing but slogging your body twice a day, every day. So I would argue that the training was upped in the summer for getting prepared for the big international meets, um, simply because you had more time and space to do it. Um, and again, nobody, nobody really competed past their university years. There was no money. There was no funding. Um, you pretty well accomplished what you were going to accomplish. And in most athletes' minds anyway, you've been to the Olympics or Commonwealth Games or whatever. So it was time to pack it in and, and, and get a job. So, uh, this was your one kick at it for four years. Nowadays, people are swimming past universities so they can do that kind of intense training 12 months a year uh, if they're getting enough funding, et cetera. So, so that was the big change. All right. Yeah. And that big change certainly paid off because you ended up going to the 1972 Olympics. So take us to the moment that you competed in the finals at the 100 meter butterfly. What was it like to compete against the best in the world at that time? Well, and that's, uh, I mean, it, it, going to the combo games before and then the Pan Ams was nice to get those under the belt because there's nothing like the beast that's the Olympic Games. It's so much more than anything that any athlete could ever experience. It's just, it's massive. It's just, part of it is self-inflicted because you know everybody's paying attention and know everybody understands it. A lot of people don't even know what the combo games are, right? Or, you know, they certainly don't pay that much attention or whatever, right? And so... If you want to make a name for yourself and if you want to sort of feel you've reached the pinnacle, you've got to be at the Olympic Games. So, you know, walking into, you know, normally you're in a, in a, in a spectators, there's a thousand spectators or whatever. You walk in and all of a sudden there's 10,000 people in the stands. You're going, holy crap, this is the real deal here, you know? So, and, and it's wall to wall live television. And again, nowadays with streaming and that, there's a lot more live stuff. But, you know, when I was growing up, there was nothing was live. I mean, no swim meets were ever live. And uh, so this was a pretty big deal. This And and I, I'm pretty sure this was the first Olympics, actually. 1972 Olympics were the first ones that were ever live. I think there was a little bit from the one in 68 in Mexico, but I don't think very much. Technology wasn't there. So 72 was wall-to-wall -wall coverage, and that's that's obviously a big deal as well. So, so yeah, so it's it's you understand what the the – you know, what's on the line, what you were trying to accomplish. And, and um, you know, you're trying to do it for yourself to make sure that you, you know, validating the all the work you put in in the career and you want to be one of the best. So so the one beauty is because I had been racing um, across North America and in the United States a lot, four of the guys, three of the guys uh, in the final were guys that I'd raced probably 10 or 20 times. So I was very familiar, particularly a superstar. The people today haven't surprisingly don't know the name, but his name was Mark Spitz, and he won seven gold medals back then, and, and he could have won more, but the Olympic swimming competition was only, I think, only over six days, and nowadays it's over nine or ten. He probably would have picked up another event or two, um, and probably won just as many as, as Michael Phelps won in his special Olympic game. So so Mark was going to win. We all knew it. He was much better. I mean, the one thing about Michael, uh, F Michael Phelps was, Michael did, A, a little bit longer events, but B, more importantly, Michael trained his butt off. He had a taskmaster for a coach. Back in my day, Mark Spitz didn't train very hard. All right? I mean, he did when he was in high school, but then he got a, it wasn't as intense, but he was so unbelievably talented that he didn't have to train very hard and he could still beat us all by body length. Right? And so, you know, all of us would stand in the blocks and we'd feel a silver medal as a gold medal because we knew we weren't beating Mark. So, so anyway, so he was there and there was another guy that I was in they were my age. They were grade 12 when I was grade 12. So, I mean, I've known these guys forever. And the other guy, same thing. He was from Dallas. And he was uh, two lanes over from me. Um, and then the guy that I raced at the Commonwealth Games was four lanes over, five lanes over. And a, and a Canadian guy was in lane five. Um, and then an East German that I'd raced once or twice. And then another East German that I'd never heard of. Right? And that was pretty well the field. So, so it wasn't really a big change. I wasn't intimidated really by these athletes. I kind of knew where I stood. I knew I couldn't beat Mark. Um, and I thought maybe one or two of the other guys I might be able to take take on. Um, but the funny part about it was, Amos, when I finished, I looked up at the scoreboard. And at the time, because they'd gone from six lanes to eight lanes, I think the previous Olympics, it used to only be six lanes in the Olympic Games, they gave certificates for the people who finished top six and they hadn't upgraded the rules to say, well, you're in the top eight, you should, everybody should get one. So I wanted to make damn sure I was at least sixth place. So I got a certificate that said I was in the Olympic final. And so I looked at the board and I was sixth place. And I went, you know what? That's perfect. I'm, I'm happy with sixth place. It's what I wanted to do. Um, and the guy that was fifth was just a little bit ahead of me. But then the first four guys were, were pretty well almost a second ahead. So I really, it wasn't like I was 
you know, just missing a medal or anything like that. So, so I was happy with the performance um, and, and pleased with the way it turned out. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned Mark Spitz because actually that's, that was a name that was more well known, not just back then when you were competing, but also when Michael Phelps was about to hit the eight. Well, no, I kept talking about him in reference that yeah, they, yeah, they're yeah. try to be Mark Spitz. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, it was, it was a big deal, and it was a very big one. Mine. Here's a class. Here's what I've been saying earlier: is that you know you couldn't make a penny. You couldn't actually be advertise your services to give swim lessons to get paid because then you were a pro and you were thrown out of the Olympic Games. So you know, Mark had to retire after the '72 Olympics because he had to, you know he wanted to sign sponsorship deals. He wanted to make some money, and then he made a ton of money, right? And he invested it very wisely. Good for him. But if he could have made the money and continued to swim, which athletes can do today. He would have gone for another four years minimum because he nobody could touch him. Nobody his times in seventy two would have still been competitive, right? So um, you know, and and if they weren't weren't, he would have trained harder. They would have been right. So it wasn't a big guy. He's only five eleven, but um, um, so he was out after that Olympic Games. As were almost all, all the other guys in the Olympic final. Mm, well, there were a couple that stuck around, but you know, they were starting to get funding back then. It was just starting to come around after this. And nothing like what Mark Spitz was earning. You couldn't be a pro pro like that with endorsements, but it was starting to be government funding and stuff like that that kept a few people swimming a little bit longer. Now there's a lot of that. So people swim three Olympic games sometimes. Yeah. That's fascinating though, because if he went for another Olympics, we would not have seen a, a new gold medal record for Michael Phelps. We would not have seen that at, a, at, at that eight gold medal record would not have been anything well, it would have been still special, but it wouldn't have been, you know, the precedent, like what that special that was back then in 2008. Because yeah. Mark Spitz could have arguably gone eight, nine, or even ten, you know, at, at one point. I mean, that's from my initial assumption, but, you know, well, that's... He could, have picked up another, he could have picked up another event if he wanted to, you're right, you know? So he yeah. could have probably gone to eight if he needed to. I know that he didn't enter the backstroke races, and he, and he beat the three Americans that went silver, bronze, and fourth place. He cleaned them in workouts. Right. And so you never know. He might have been able to pick that up. I mean, it was a it was a very good East German. I don't know if he'd beat him, but he would have run he would have given him a hell of a run. You know what I mean? Right. And he used to hold the world record in a four hundred meter free, which most people don't even know that he used to do that. So yeah, he could have you never know. And it's, if it would have been spread out longer, he probably would have had a better chance. So Yeah. 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 He well, was an amazing, amazing athlete. So. Yeah, absolutely. And and his medals show as well. Going back to your time as you would finish up your days competing as a competitive swimmer what do you miss the most from that time uh the adrenaline um you know like it's there's nothing particularly the relays i like the relays a lot more than individual events but um you know when you're behind the blocks and the first two guys are on their in the relay doing their job it's like whoa you know like you're there you're focused you're looking across lane to lane to see who you're racing and you're late of the relay and those were so much fun a lot of those relays that i was on um and then the, the, you know, the adrenaline of, of, of being in the moment at the time. Obviously, you know, when it turns out the way you want, that's even better, right? That's kind of success is kind of very cool. But I, I never really, um, I didn't live and die for the competition itself. I lived and died for the process. I loved the idea of showing up for workout and, and working hard and workout, but more importantly, being with my teammates. I just... I just love the whole buildup, the whole nine month training and, and getting everybody in the pool together and, and showing up and, you know, all my best friends were on the swim team. So, um, I just, I just like that whole bit of it. That was, a, that's probably the part that I missed the most. Who knows? Maybe that's probably why I got into coaching. All right. So I'm, I'm now surrounded like that the same way. All right. Now, obviously a little differently because I can't hang out with the swimmers or anything, but, um, but you know, I hang out with the coaches when I go to big meets and stuff. So. Yeah, that's probably what I miss the most is that just the group, the camaraderie. Yeah, the, the camaraderie. That that's something that I hear quite often from a lot of former athletes in university sport. When I interviewed Sandrine Menville on a different podcast, the Law School Show, she mentioned that when she finished competing, she missed the camaraderie. She doesn't really miss the you know early morning workouts back then, <laughs> but she definitely misses the camaraderie. And again, this is very common from what I've I've heard from many former athletes. The the culture of working out, I think that has really passed all the way till today. Now that with social media, now it's sort of seen as like not just a cool thing, but a trendy thing to work out and hit the gym and you know yeah. 
lift lots. Well, I mean, this is more like into the bodybuilding realm or the, the, the powerlifting uh, realm or even the CrossFit realm, depending on, on, on the interest of the people out there. But spending time in the gym nowadays, I think, has become a very trendy thing. I myself have, since my university years, I've been hitting the gym five to six days a week myself. And I, I just enjoy it because it helps you feel it, it, it feels good and it helps your health as well. So that sort of feeling, I think, is very much true nowadays. I think even more so than ever before. Yeah, I think so too. And I think obviously the, the, the change over the last 20 years would be that uh, women are in the gym now, right? You know, women didn't go to the gym. It wasn't seen to be cool or whatever. And I think that's a huge plus for, um, for women in general, obviously, right? But it's certainly helping them to be even better athletes as well. So, uh, you know, I... I have one or two athletes, um, and and I tried to convince you know women athletes that I tried to convince to get in the weight room, and they didn't they don't want to do it, right? They didn't want to get too many muscles, and I'm kind of going, yeah, you, it, you know, you'll get over that. It's not a big issue, and and you know, but anyway, the whole culture is now uh, obviously uh, to the point now where everybody goes into the gym, male, female, whatever, right? And um, and I think it's a real plus, um, and and the culture is that the culture now is very simple. You want to succeed, you have to train hard. All right. There's no question that if you want to be a top athlete, you want to be a good basketball player, you want to be a good swimmer, you want to be a good track athlete, you're not getting there by hook or by crook. You're not getting there by, oh, I think I'll show up today. Ah, oh, no, I'm not going to go to work out today. You're not going to make it. You know, like it's, it's, the, it's, it's too competitive now, you know. And, you know, again, probably back in my day, it wasn't as competitive. There weren't as many people. You know, I, I mentioned that there were, what, 23 countries that shared the Olympic swimming medals now versus nine back in the 70s. They're swimming everywhere. They're doing, you know, they're pole vaulting everywhere. They're doing lots of things everywhere. And it's just a much, much more competitive environment if you want to be a good athlete. If you want to excel, you know that, the, you know, Charlie down the road or Susie down the road, they're going, they're getting up and going in the morning, all right? I had one coach, I remember this was, oh, maybe 10 or 20 years ago. And at um, 12.01, midnight, one minute past midnight, he had a mandatory workout for his internationally aspiring athletes and and he did it on the the, um, the international date line so he, he made it like they were in australia but he so he got them there a little bit you know uh whatever it was in, in australia probably i don't know 10 o'clock at night or whatever but when it was 1201 officially in the world the first place in the world went to 1201 in the morning in an olympic year he said we're getting in the water because we're showing we're keen and we're going to get more work in than anybody else in the world before the olympic games comes around you know irrelevant the amount of work they did at 1201 in that night okay but it was the concept of wrapping your head around the commitment that you are going to train hard and you're going to put the time in and the effort or you're just not going to be competitive so so that's a that's a that's a big a big thing and 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 my thanks to all the club coaches out there that i recruit athletes from because when i say here's the workout schedule for the year they they get it they're, they're coming to university knowing what the deal is. Like they don't blink an eye to do to, to you know get up at six o'clock in the morning. Um, so that's you know thanks to the coaches because they've educated these athletes. They know what it takes to be good, right? So so it's great. It makes my job a little easier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and speaking about your job, along with it being a little bit easier from the change, the positive change in culture in terms of training for the swimming athletes, you as a coach in the early days. You would start, as you mentioned, at York University, and then you would later to become U of T's head coach of swimming. So, what inspires you to immediately begin sw- uh, begin coaching? Rather, great question, Amos, because it it really was not in the cards. Um, I did a commerce degree, um, and I was on my way to actually do a. Sorry, there's a fly just flew by. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, to do an MBA, um, and even though you know I loved everything about swimming and everything. Um, but after I started the MBA, I decided, you know what, I'm not hundred percent sure that's the direction I want to go. So I took some physiology courses and I got a master's degree in recreation actually. Um, and I still wasn't really totally sold that I was, I was going to be a swim coach. And again, part of that was that there weren't a lot of job openings for swim coaches back then. Now there's a lot, but back then it wasn't again, a profession that was really taking off yet at that particular point. So um, but then I reflected on it because I've been asked this question many times. Um, and it turns out, in hindsight, through my career as, a, as an athlete, the five 
different programs that I was at as I went from, you know, an age group summer to high school to university to, you know, club or whatever. Those coaches that I had in those particular programs, every single one of them is in some coaches hall of fame. They are luminaries in the sport. Some of the best ever coaches, like one of the youngest ever Olympic coaches, the guy who went on to be the CEO of American swimming for 25 years. Um, you know, the, 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 the coach that coached the high school team that was the number one team in the country, right? And the guy that was, anyway, luminaries in the sport, and I learned from all of them, and I think I got inspired from all of them. They had the passion, they had the knowledge, they, 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 they loved the sport of swimming, and it rubbed off on me, and I think it was like, you know what? I think I should get involved in the sport of swimming. So I was in the right place at the right time. York University just had a guy that was a coach that left, and turned out that they wanted somebody with a master's degree in recreation to coach the swim team. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm, there's no question. I'm probably the only guy in North America that has that, right? So uh, with a, you know, the background of, of elite swimming. So, so I got the job and it was just, it was wonderful. I absolutely loved coaching at York University. Um, it was my first team. I felt closer to it, I think, because it was the first team I'd ever coached. Um, you know, they took a gamble on me, obviously, because I wasn't a proven coach, um, but it worked. And then I moved from there up to two years to U of T, and, and it was a painful move. And it's for the simple reason that I didn't want to leave York because this, those were my guys, you know. And I only coached the men back then. Um, and they had, they had gone out on a limb, and, you know, York had trusted me and the team, you know, it was a small team. We only had 13 kids the first year, and, you know, we were building it into a juggernaut. And I actually felt if I hadn't left, we were going to win the national title the next year. So, um, but U of T, as, again, as I said, I was only coaching men at the time. And so 30% of your team is probably going to be engineers, and New York didn't have an engineering faculty. So um, that was number one. Number two, they had a 50 meter pool at U of T. Um, and number three was going to be a little easier to recruit kids to, to U of T just because of the academic reputation. So I made the move um, to go there, and, and five years, six years later, whatever it was, um, the women's coach moved into a more administrative role, and I took over the women's team. So I've been you know, coaching... 40 plus whatever years the men's team, but I, um, but the women's team is, is five or six years less than that, but still it's in the forties, I think as well. So. Yeah. And with these very important moves at the right place at the right time with York university and then U of T, what were the early challenges that you faced when you transitioned from competitive swimming to being a coach? Well, the first one is, is a really obvious, well, maybe it's not obvious, but it was, um, it's uh, logical when I give you the answer is that uh, I was too young, all right? Um, well, I wasn't too young. Let me rephrase that. I knew the swimmers too well. Like two of the best swimmers on my team at York University were former teammates. So I know I, 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 I swam the second quad running, which hardly anybody did back then. So I was 25, 26 years old when these other guys were 20, 21, 22. So yes, they were my teammates. I was still three, four years older than them, but they still, they were my teammates. And so I, I kind of, I, the challenge was to separate yourself from your friends because they were my friends. You know, one guy in particular was a reasonably good friend and I was now his coach. So I had to figure out how to deal with him as a friend and at the same time, not make him um, um, ostracized in the eyes of his teammates on the team that he's getting special special attention or a special consideration or whatever. So, so that was that was a challenge in my first year, um, or first two years, I should say. And I, I think I handled it fairly well, um, but it was probably the biggest challenge that I had. Um, and then I went to U of T, and now I'm two years older, and I don't know anybody on the team. And so immediately now that barrier is is there. It's already there. I tried to make it even a bigger barrier, and that was a giant mistake. We talked about coaches talking about their mistakes. Well, this was a very big mistake on my part. I decided I would coach, and it's the only thing that I realized from those luminary coaches that I had that wasn't going to work for me. And that was, I'm the general and they're little soldiers, and they'll jump when I say jump. And that is not my personality. I'm not an in-your-face, yell, scream type of a guy. And I didn't want them to fear me. And so uh, I realized I needed to really invest in them as people and, and talk to them and motivate them by caring for them. Um, and I didn't do that my first year at U of T and I alienated a couple of the best swimmers on the team. And I realized it was a big mistake and I corrected that uh, ever, you know, ever since after that. So, so I learned from that. So that was a, that was a learning experience, i.e. the biggest challenge is figure out what you are as a coach, how, what drives you as a coach, what personality traits are you going to bring to coach 
And I didn't know. I started, I'd never really coached before. So, um, you know, I figured out one way. I worked at York University. And then I had to do a, a, a bit of an adjustment when I got to the University of Toronto because I tried to change my personality and it didn't work. So, so that would probably be the biggest challenge um, of being from an athlete going to a coach is you got to, you know, you got to figure out what you are as a coach. And I guess the second one is you got to implement your ideas. And the third one is, not everybody may love the sport as much as you. <laughs> and that was a that was a big wake up call. Um, I loved everything about it. I worked hard. I wanted to do it. I, I lived for it. And there's some people that you know what, they love being on the team. But yeah, they got other fish to fry They're You know, they got some other things on their plate. And it just it blew my mind. They weren't as committed as I was. So that, that took me a while to figure out how to at least get them to buy into enough of a point where everybody's pretty happy and on the same page. Yeah. And I would imagine that when you transitioned from comp competing to coaching, your perspective on the sport of swimming would have also changed and evolved over time. So how did it change, if at all? Um, yeah, I, I, other than that big change, right? That first year where I tried one thing, it didn't work. Um, I don't think it has changed very much. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I'm still not the, I'm not a disciplinarian. Um, I, I basically try to create an environment where the athletes want to show up to the pool and they want to work hard. Um, and I, I think I've done a very good job at it. I've probably over time been able to um, provide a little more incentives for the athletes to commit. What I mean by that is there's more funding now and I've been able to raise money with the alumni to, you know, send some kids to Europe. Um, so I've tried to enhance their, enrich their program. Um, and it makes them, buy in maybe a little bit more right you know extrinsic motivation is nice you got to have in intrinsic motivation and i've got to somehow motivate them to find that within themselves but extrinsic motivation can also help a little bit as well all right and we've had some pretty good teams and i've had some pretty good success so then that can also build you know it's very important you know i remember one person saying you know when you're coaching you got to get the big dog and you get the big dog on your team and the big dog's going to bring in some other athletes. And and we've had some pretty big dogs over the years, and, and I've done a good job with them. And so that then can usually help you recruit some other people to your team. So it's a little different than, you know, high school stuff when you're just, you got to coach the kids that show up, right? Whereas university, I do recruit, and I try to get the, obviously I try to go after some of the better athletes and bring them to the team. So, so how do you recruit? With great difficulty. <laughs> All right, and, and the reason I say that is that um, you know the NCAA is 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 you know it's the it's the beast, it's the bear in the in the room. It's like you know they've got more money than you can shake a stick at, more PR, more media presence, more everything than um, we could ever ever hope to compete with uh, here in Canada. Uh, more prime time coverage, just more name recognition. I mean, all that kind of stuff and. And then also there's there's the fact that the competition level can be a little bit higher level, which again, isn't that, it's not nearly as big a deal in the sport of swimming as it may be in the sport of basketball if you're trying to get drafted into the NBA or, or whatever, whereas you've got to play against a certain level of people. And obviously the, the level that, I don't know, some of those schools, North Carolina or whatever in the States, is a pretty high level of basketball so or football or whatever. Um, but in swimming, you know, you can succeed training in your own lane. If the coach does a good job with you, you can still win an Olympic medal, right? You don't have to be in a high-powered program or anything like that. So in swimming, it's not quite as critical to be around the absolute best, but there are a lot of people, and it. it creates a lot of excitement down there. Um, and they have scholarships, big scholarships, okay? The most that I can offer somebody is forty-five. actually now it's $5,000. You know, tuition is 8000 a little bit more in some of the professional faculties. And then room and board is, you know, whatever, fifteen, seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000, right? So... Whereas in the U.S., you can get a full scholarship. You can get it all paid for. And so there are a lot of people that want to do that. Um, now, most of the programs in the United States, because swimming is not football, not everybody gets funded. So they're usually only on 50% scholarships if they go down. So you're still going to end up paying probably 20 grand U.S. if you go to the U.S. Some places 30. Um, so it isn't as much of a big draw as it used to be, but it's, it's still a big draw. And... Um, and it's tough to recruit against that. And the second big challenge I have is that if you don't, if you're not in the mid eighties, um, you're not getting in, and, if, and probably in the mid nineties for engineering, um, you're not getting into the University of Toronto. 
And in the United States, that's irrelevant. I mean, I've lived through that situation. I know what it's like. And if you're an elite athlete, um, and I know some of the people that were at my university and other universities, and they were they were below par academic kids. Um, you know, they were kid, they would have been kids that probably had C's and D's in high school. And they went right through admissions process, bypassed everything, and were floated into admission, got into school. No problem, right? We can't do that in Canada, right? And I certainly can't do that at the University of Toronto. So, so that eliminates a whole, you know, swimmers are very good students, but they're still, yeah, I've, you know, I've had one or two really, really good athletes that wanted to come to the program. And, you know, they're the, they're the 10% of the group that just, they, I tell them that there's no way, don't even think about it. You're not going to make it. You're not going to get in number one. And if you came in, you probably wouldn't make it. So, so that's, a, that's a big challenge, right? Versus um, recruiting kids away from the United States. But the beauty is that we have a great university. And so students, kids that want to be, you know, realize that, let's face it, there's only one Mark Spitz. There's only one Michael Phelps. Um, you're not going to make, you're not going to retire off what you do in sport of swimming. Uh, and after your four years or five years of university, you're going to need a job. <laughs> you're going to need a, something that you're going to do for the rest of your life, and you're going to need to earn an income. And so University of Toronto is going to open a crap load of doors for you, and, and so you're going to learn a lot here. I think over half, I think I don't know, 60% or something of the athletes on my team do postgraduate work. I mean, they're very good students, and they want to go on to you know, get a master's in psychology or go on to be a doctor or whatever it is. So um so that's the that's the ace I have up my sleeve is that you know I'm recruiting really good students, um, and then I'm also recruiting swimmers that want to be part of a winning program. We win and we've done well, and we at least have a track record that I can help sell to the athletes. So, yeah, and Canada Canadian universities have the notion of student athlete, whereas American universities have the notion of athlete student, and. Yeah. Even if you were a Mark Spitz or a Michael Phelps, you you won't be swimming forever anyways, right? You're going to get old. You're not going to be in, in your prime anymore. You're going to have to do something else outside of that. I mean, th this is also true for every other sport as well. So I argue that the Canadian university approach is better than the American university approach because the, the student athletes that participate in, for example, U of T swimming, they have a more rounded base. They have a good program. They have a good knowledge base, a good work and skills base from their academic areas, while also having, well, the, the best coaches in the country in training them to be the best possible swimmers that they could ever be. So whereas in the, in the U.S., sure, you have the best sports programs in the entire country, but if you're not, what if you don't get into the NBA, for example? What if you don't get into the NFL? all of a sudden you're left with your academic side, but if it's not strong enough, sorry to say this in this day and age, there are still many jobs that still look at your transcripts. You're going to, yeah. you're going to have a lot of difficulty trying to find jobs with that, with subpar marks. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, there are, you know, we, we it's not, a it's not a black and white situation. Um, there are good programs in the U S obviously good academic programs. There's lots of kids coming through, Swimming programs there, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to say, yeah, if you go down there, you're going to be screwed. Well, you're not. There's a, there's a lot of good programs down there and, and a lot of, you know, coaches and, and counselors that are, are are making sure that the athletes are, are getting good stuff down there as well, right? You know, so, but it doesn't always work that way. You've got to make sure you're in the right place in the right circumstance. And, and I think in swimming, it's a little bit better than it is maybe in some of the team sports in the U.S., but... Anyway, that's uh, you know, it's it's not a cut and dry situation. Of course, but yeah. I do believe we, I do believe we do a good job in, in Canada for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I also, I mean, yeah, I also wanted to clarify myself that you know, it's not like you said, it's not a black and white situation because yeah. it's you know, so it, it's just you know, the general trend. What I'm basically yeah. talking about is just the general trend between the two countries. Yeah. Low, I like, think the, yeah. the best example I can give on, on how it works is and how important scholarships are is, you know. A couple of the bad, you know, some of the better universities in the United States are Yale and Princeton and Harvard, for sake of argument, and a couple more in the Ivy League, right? You never hear of those teams when you're hearing about sports in the United States and NCAA. They never make the, they never make the, you know, the football, whatever that's called, the football bowls or whatever, right? They never make the basketball finals, the March Madness. They're never in the top 10 or 20 in the NCAA swimming championships, right? Because 
swimmers don't want to have to pay fifty, sixty thousand dollars to go to school when they can get it for free, right? Or cheaper, whatever, right? So, um, so it's you know, it's 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 an interesting mix that you got. Is that what you know? We're we're kind of like the Harvards and the Yales in the sense that we're selling the academics number one, but you're going to have to pay for it. Um, and so we're not going to get all the kids. The kids are going to go where they can get a lot of it paid for, right? right? And so it's a little more critical in the U.S. because everywhere down there, tuition is off off the charts. Um, whereas a little more reasonable here, and I think that's why some families have decided, you know, what it's okay. Tuition here is eight grand. If they're good enough, then they get a scholarship of five thousand from you know an Ontario university. Yeah, you see, we can we can handle that, you know. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So going back to coaching swimmers that you are able to recruit. How do you adapt to the different learning and training styles of different swimmers? Well, I mean, it's a challenge. I mean, I, I think, it, you know, the longer you're in the business, the more you understand the, 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 the youth that are coming in. Um, but it's kind of like there's not much I haven't seen, <laughs> I guess, right? So it might have been more of a challenge. Some of the athletes that I have that have been, you know, the word we kind of use is high maintenance. Right? Some of the athletes that might be more high maintenance than others. Um, you know, I might have been a bit of a, a bit of a more of a challenge when I was a young coach or whatever. You know, it would have frustrated the hell out of me probably. Um, but I just understand that they learn differently. You know, and they you, you just you know what did somebody say? It's like you know you're trying to open the door, right? You're trying to open the door and look inside and see what makes them work. And for some some kids, you know, some of the swimmers on my team, it, it's one thing. For the others, it's another thing. And some of them, you know what? They're they're going to do stuff that's like, oh my god, you know, what are they thinking? All right, you just have to kind of reel them back in, you know. And there may be things where they piss off their competitor, their um, teammates, and you just have to figure out how to make it all work. Um, it's a it's a big jigsaw puzzle, um, but just like I don't know, just like a friend group. You may have, you know, your best buddies that you grew up with in high school. By the time you reach your 20s, yeah, one or two of those guys may not be the same dudes they were when they were 10, 12, or 15 years old, but they're still your friends, and you're still going to tolerate them and learn how to make it work. And I think as a coach, I've got to do that same thing, too. I've got all these people, different personalities. I've got 40, 45 people in the program. They are not going to be the same. They are going to have different personalities. There are going to be different things that are going to, push buttons for different ones, right? And as I said, some of them are going to be phenomenally high maintenance. Um, and I had a, a swimmer 20, 30 years ago that was an elite world-class swimmer. And and I and I basically said, you know, you're pretty high maintenance, all right? And the athlete looked me right in the eye and said, I know, but I'm worth it. I deserve it. I'm the best. And I went, yeah, okay. I'm not so sure everybody else wants to hear that, right? But, you know, I, I, what I try to say is that, look, I'm going to give some of these people a little bit extra attention if and when they need it, but I'm going to give 100% attention to the team. So I'm just going to find another 10% above that somehow, somewhere, you know? And so I work 60, 70 hours a week so I can do that extra. So I can, you know, the ones that need a little bit more for whatever reason. And nowadays, unfortunately, athletes seem to be a little more stressed than they have been in my history of coaching. Um, there's a lot more counseling that's going on now. So I've got to find more time now because there's athletes that they need to sit and talk because there's, there's a lot of confusion out there right now. And um, there's a lot more counseling that's being done now than I've probably ever experienced in my life. Wow. That, that, that's a lot. That is a lot that you have to handle, especially as head coach. And wow, that, 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 that's yeah. a lot. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is a lot. Now, I'm very lucky. I have an assistant coach that works with me. Linda Kiefer is her name. She's been with me now 30-something years. Um, and she's very good coach. And she's very good with the athletes. And I think it's a phenomenal advantage that we have having a male and a female coach. Obviously, we coach male and females. We have coached the men's and women's team. Um, but having a female on staff, because, you know, there aren't as many, nearly as many females that are coaching at a high level as there are men in every sport, let alone the sport of swimming. So, um, but we've been able to work it such that because I do the TV, I'm not allowed to travel with the national team. I can't be an Olympic coach. I was back in the day before... The Olympic Committee passed a rule you can't do both. Um, so I'm no longer allowed to be on the deck at big international competitions, but we've been able to get Linda named to the staff and uh, with good reason. She's a great coach, and we obviously had some Olympic athletes, including Kylie Moss, 
So it was, it behooves the swimming association to have the coaches of their best athletes on the staff. So, so, so she's got great experience. She's done great jobs. She was just at the last Olympics, the last worlds and everything. And, um, so we have the pair of us and I think that helps a lot. Um, I don't think I could coach 45 athletes and I couldn't at the level that we're asking me to coach at. So, so having two coaches really helps. And, and I even have a part-time assistant, Doug Vanderby, that helps me out as well. That was one of my former swimmers. So you, you need that kind of, um, assistance with everything that we have to do. You know, I have to fundraise, I have to recruit, I have to do all these things. Right. So. So how do you determine a swimmer's best stroke or greatest potential in a particular stroke or set of strokes? Has it already been shown bef before the university years or do you still see it or see potential for a new stroke or whatever at the university level? How do you determine that? Great. I mean, it's, I wouldn't call it the million dollar question, but it's a big one, right? Okay. Um, by and large, I would say for 75% of the athletes, they've been trained pretty hard in high school um, in the sport of swimming because again we have professional coaches that are in their living coaching so if they don't produce kids and get kids to swim faster they're gonna lose their job so i mean they're pretty focused on it they're not doing anything else so um so when the athletes come in they, i've got a pretty good idea you know so i i recruited a, a you know a great example all right we have a first year student coming in katie schroeder's her name from langley bc outside of vancouver and she's one of the best backstrokers, probably the best, she's the best backstroker in, in grade 12 in the country, all right, this year, this past year. And and we we're quite pleased that she chose to, to come across country and come to the University of Toronto. I've watched everything else she does over the last year and a half or so before, you know, she's going to step foot on the pool deck this September. And she's a backstroker, she's a backstroker, and she's a backstroker. It's a done deal, all right? She's not, we're not going to venture into anything else. Her other strokes aren't that good. Um, she can probably do some other stuff, the butterfly when we need her, but she's never going to reach the level that she is, um, at already in the backstroke. Now we'll want to get her to another level, obviously, and we'll go better than that. Then there are ones that all of a sudden they come in and you realize, you know what, we need to make a change here. And, and you can't not again, by the time they reach 18, it's pretty cut and dry what they're going to do, but maybe they can pick up uh, an extra event. So maybe there's something excuse me, the 50 freestyle and the 100 freestyle, and I can teach them to do maybe 100 butterfly. But they probably won't lose their, their main event. The difference is, the odd time, a Kylie Moss comes along, all right? And Kylie Moss came in as a backstroker and a butterflyer, leaning towards the butterfly and actually the individual medley. Those were her strokes coming out of grade 12. And within the first week, I went, yeah, I think this girl's going to be a backstroker. I really do. And so we started focusing pretty exclusively on the backstroke to see if our feelings were right. They were. <laughs> All right. So that, that was definitely, she's pretty good in the other strokes. Um, you know, she's still world, you know, she's still a reasonable, if we worked on it harder at the time, we probably could have made her into a world class, not as high, not winning Olympic medal high, but probably a pretty elite butterfly. All right. And I was a bit disappointed, to be honest. I thought I could get her to an elite freestyle level and it didn't quite pan out. She got pretty good, but we were missing a few ingredients and I would have needed more time to get her probably to the freestyle elite level, but the backstroke obviously paid off a measure way. And, you know, she's still at, at that level now. Wow. Yeah. Nice. And I'm glad you mentioned Kylie Moss because I wanted to get to Kylie. How was the process of turning Kylie into the swimmer that she is today? How was that process like from the very beginning, from when you saw the potential in her backstroke all the way up to the present day? Yeah. I mean, great question. Um, and, and the reason is that, you know, what worked for her isn't necessarily going to, you know, I, I haven't had three more Kylie's in the last five years, you know, right? So it, it's, a, it's a unique situation and you've got to pull all the right levers and, and you've got to do the, the right things at the right time and you have to have the athlete that's going to make that happen. So so when she came in, um, I when, when she came on a recruiting trip, um, she uh, visited us and it was hard to get it organized because she was being recruited by some of the, she was thinking about going to the U.S. She grew up in Windsor, so she's, you know, across the river from the U.S. and Detroit. So, um, so it was, you know, it was, and I mean, a lot of other buddies have gone to the U.S., so she was thinking strongly about it. But then luckily we were able to, believe it or not, the only time I could find that she was free to come and didn't want to miss any school because she's a smart student was Thanksgiving weekend. And she said she could come up on Thanksgiving Monday because their family celebrated on Sunday. And she'd come up Thanksgiving Monday and then, uh, you know, train with me on Tuesday because we weren't training on Thanksgiving Monday. So she'd arrive on Sunday, on Monday night, train with us Tuesday and go home Tuesday night. So she only missed one day of school. 
So she came in on, on Monday and she actually came to um, my house and had Thanksgiving dinner with me and my family. <laughs> so, you know, that just, we had nowhere else to have her go, right? If <laughs> she's coming in because all the other swimmers are back with their families, right? And so she came here and then she trained with us on my, on Tuesday and I noticed that her kick was very weak. She had a very weak kick. They hadn't worked on it hardly at all when she was growing up in Windsor. And she was, she had, she needed to grow. She was always one of the smallest in her program and she was one of the smallest in high school. And, you know, she didn't grow a lot, but she probably, I don't know, grew an inch or maybe two in, in, in university. But more importantly, she hadn't had any weight training or strength training and hadn't had a lot of extra swim training for lack of another word so in other words maybe she averaged four kilometers in a workout and we averaged five or six so you're just talking about just more and more work and more and more background work um, and stuff that you can build like a um, you're building a pyramid right and her base was really small so we had to extend the base out and then of course eventually if you have a wider base eventually your pyramid's going to be taller isn't it so uh you know a really skinny one's going to fall over i guess right this is going to be a very steady big tall base and so it was going to be a longer <clears throat> A longer project and most people will be shocked to hear that in her first year she didn't know she didn't win the national championship all right she she was second place and uh that that at the end of the season we went to the pan am games trials and and she actually had a a, a, a bad experience and what i mean by that is she dropped her time by another half a second which is very impressive and qualified first and then at night two more experienced veterans beat her and she went, I think a tenth or two slower, I can't remember, but the point was she missed the team, and that was for the Pan Am Games in Toronto later that summer, which is a big games. You, you rarely ever get to swim games in your home country, and she looked like she was going to make it after her preliminary swim, and then boom, those two veterans just beat her in the little things, the starts, the turns, and all that. Turned out to be a silver lining because she made the World Student Games off of that swim, which were end of August in uh, Korea, and then we did, you know, you do the little right things. Sometimes they miss, they pay off, all right? And because this World Student Games was not supported by some Canada um, to any degree, the athletes had to pay their own way. So we were able to find funding to get Kylie to go. But more importantly, everybody was flying in like three days before the competition started. Well, you're traveling for 20 hours. Three days is not enough time to adjust. So I researched some really good hotels that had a swimming pools. And we flew her, and we had another boy in the team named Eli, and we flew them in ahead of the whole entire contingent and had them stay in the hotel for two days to acclimatize in good situations. Because when you get to a, a village, you know, you're there with 20 people, sometimes six or eight in a room. Um, you know, food's different. You're not sleeping as well. It's it, Anyway, it's just not a good situation. So we put them in the hotel for a couple of days, so you get you know, a real nice bed, your own bedroom, your own bathroom, um, nice food in the restaurant. And they could swim in this pool. I found the hotel that had a big enough pool. Right? So they could swim in the pool to get over the jet lag. And then they went into the meet and boom, she swam on the second day or whatever it was and dropped her time every time she swam prelim semis to finals and had a major breakthrough there, won the gold medal. And after that, she rarely ever, she was never off the podium again for seven or eight more years. So we did the right things there and we just kept doing the right things. Um, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm on a roll. I'll give you another example. All right. So, the Commonwealth Games in 2018 were going to be an outdoor pool in Australia against the girl that was number two or three in the world. So Kylie was going to have to, you know, like she's sitting there going, okay, well, I, I've never raced outdoors. You know, now she's the world, she won the world championships in 2017. So she, she's, she's favored to challenge the gold medal, but it's in the Australian's backyard in her pool uh, outdoors. So we sent Kylie to Rome for a competition because it was an outdoor pool. So she could get used to racing outdoors. There's no outdoor pools in Canada. There's no races in Canada outdoors, all right? And there aren't very many in the U.S. at the time we were looking at either, right? So I even sent her to a training camp to Phoenix because Phoenix is sunshine galore, and we have seven days of training and use of the sunshine. And, of course, lo and behold, what happens when we get there? They have the storm of the century, and for days it rains. <laughs> and so, so all, what I'm saying is all the great planning doesn't always work, okay? But here's the silver lining to that story. Commonwealth Games? Before it rained, the night of her 100 backstroke final. Wow, she practiced in the rain, right? She outtouched the Australian by two one hundredths of a second. Go out. So you know what? Maybe none of the stuff we did to prepare her worked, but at the same time, maybe it did. And swimming is a race of hundreds of a second when you get to be one of the very best. So, you know, the little things that you do right are going to pay off in the long run, I think. So what was it like to call her bronze medal win? 
Okay, well, that that was this one that because she was not favored to win an Olympic medal. Um, you know, she was going in, I think fifth or something. I think sixth or something. Right? She was in lane two for the final. Um, I do know that. And uh, when I call races, I do have to remove myself. I mean, you know what? I'm I'm very 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 objective. Um, so I. I wouldn't have been going, you know, and Kylie's moving up, you know, and I'm hoping in my mind, oh, she has a chance. Well, no, if, I'd be saying that if it was somebody else that was moving up in lane two or if it was somebody else, you know. I may mention a Canadian like Kylie or someone else just because I know the viewers want to know where they're at in the race. But it isn't like, oh, well, I hope she moves up. No, you can't. I can't do that. So, I'm, you know, again, by the time I'm calling Kylie's Olympic race, it's my eighth Olympic Games or whatever. So I'm, I'm pretty good at um not being biased, I guess, towards my own athletes. Um, if anything, I'm going to make sure I'm not. So I'll, I'll actually um, not give them a hope, right? If somebody says, oh, do you think they have a chance to win a medal? I'm going, well, you know, I'm not so sure, you know. Even if I think down deep, yeah, there's a chance. But I'm not going to say that, right, on air. So, so anyway, so we're calling the race. And, and uh, it was really anybody's race. It was pretty close. Um, the the, the there was about four tenths or something separating the first five or six people after the preliminaries or after the semis, I should say. And as it turned out, when they touched the wall, it was only, I think, three tenths or two tenths between the first five swimmers. I mean, it was like, other than the first, the, the swimmer that won was out there. But then second, third, fourth, fifth were like a blanket touch, whoever touched the wall best. So I don't call the last 10 meters when I'm working with my play-by-play -play partner. He takes the start, then I take it a little bit. He takes the turn, then I take it for a bit, and then he does the last 10 meters. So in the last 10 meters, Kylie could have ended up second. She could have ended up sixth, right? So it really wasn't anything that I was going to say or anybody else was going to say. So I got to watch it. So I'm watching the touch as the race is being called. And, of course, it was so close again. But what happens now is the names come up. All right, when they touch for the medals. Didn't have that, obviously, in the old days, but it's a new technology now. So all of a sudden, her name comes up, Mass, third. I'm going, like, literally. I mean, pretty soon, you know, the play-by-play -play guys saying that's the race. And about five to seven seconds later, I've got to get in and do the slow mos. Um, so, I, you know, there's this momentary where the heart, my heart jumps. I go, oh, my God, Kylie just won a bronze medal. All right, because it just was, you know, it's, as we said earlier in the program, the Olympics is the Olympics is the Olympics. It's the biggie. And and you've got an Olympic medal. Nobody can ever take that away from you. And that will be your calling card for your life, basically, you know? So so I was I was just so proud of her and so happy. And and so but then I gotta do slow motion. So I said so okay, well and the star you can see uh, 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 at that return, you know. Uh, Hosu, the the Hungarian girl is in the lead and everything. The American girl's solidly in second place, but now the American girl's starting to hurt a little bit, everybody to the wall, and now you know, you can see Kylie Moss second from the top, right? She's right there with the shoulder, but she's going to get her right arm over. Look at how quickly her right arm comes over, and that's going to get her to tie for – she actually tied for the bronze medal. Tied for the bronze medal, um, just hundreds away from the silver medal, but also hundreds away from not winning the medal. Yeah, so, so yeah, I, I think I, 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 I've been able to do it. I've called a lot more of her races now, too, right? And even when she broke the world record and won the world championships – Again, she's very good at touching the wall. She only broke the world record by two one hundredths of a second, so it wasn't like it was a fait accompli. And also, yeah, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you mentioned the broadcasting part because, well, first of all, to say that I mean it, that was you know it's it's fascinating to be able to see one of your own students basically to grow from great potential to realizing that potential at the Olympics and then at the World Championships. That that feeling is really, really. It, it must have been very, very satisfying. But and, it's, it's, it is satisfying. And I mean, I, what I've told people many times is that, you know, when she came to us, she was 201st in the world. So she was, nobody said this girl was going to win an Olympic medal. All right. Whereas most of the, particularly women swimmers, most of the women swimmers, by the time they reach 18, they're world beaters. If they're going to go on and win Olympic medals, you know, like I can list a litany of people, particularly in the United States and North America that, you know, yeah, okay, they won an Olympic medal, but when they were 12, they broke the national record. When they were 14, they were ranked number one in the country. You know, this is almost all the Americans are like that. All right. And, and, and arguably some of the Canadians, even now, Penny Alexiak won the Olympic gold medal when she was 16. Right. So, I mean, it happens when you're at a young age and in female swimming in particular, not so much men because of the whole testosterone thing and everything. But um, so the fact that she was 201st, well, two years before that, when she was 16, when a lot of these other people like Penny are winning gold medals, 
she was 99th at the Canadian Olympic trials, right? Like she was almost dead last. You know, she just went, I went there to be inspired. Well, obviously it inspired her, right? To continue and go to a high level. So so that's a, that's the a, a big thing about feeling even more pride or whatever of someone like Kylie is that she was not expected to get to this level. And so to take an athlete from, you know, being okay to being really good and then being sensational is, is you know, obviously gratifying from a coach's standpoint and from the University of Toronto standpoint. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And going to broadcasting, speaking about your time as a color commentator, that's actually how we met. Well, it was actually, we met through one of your swimmers, also a long, long time friend of mine, Melanie McDonald. Yeah. Um, she was, she was actually, like she, I've known her since grade one, actually. So ah. we go way <laughs> back. That's a great, great lady. Good swimmer. Loved her on the team. Very great team lady. Um, you know, and very motivational and, and, uh, you know, room with a bunch of the athletes. They had a great time together. So, uh, yeah, she was a great one on the team. She, she'd swim some of the tougher races too, like the 200 butterflies. So yeah. Yeah. Melanie, if you're watching this, hi, hope you're doing well. Um, hi, hi. <laughs> but yeah. So it was through her that we met for, for the first time. And then, you know, many thanks to you, you helped get me my first opportunities to announcing swimming national events. To na- announcing national swimming events, I should say, wrong chronology of words there, <laughs> and it, it's a lot of fun. Even announcing the the 2018 U Sports Swimming Championships, for example, and the 2017 Canadian Junior Swimming Championships on CBC Sports. I, I mean, that was really a fun experience for me because, like you were saying about that announcing dynamic between play by play and color, play by play takes the the fir- the first ten meters, and then in the middle color you come in you analyze swims and at the turns then play by play comes back in and then once again rinse and repeat and then last 10 meters play by play takes it up so that kind of dynamic was something that i learned a lot from your announcing and also from steve armitage's announcing back in the in the day before he stepped down and elliot friedman came on you know that was it was a fascinating interesting um dynamic that i learned what was your preparation process though i mean you've done this far, 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 far longer than I could ever hope to have been able to do it. What is your preparation process for each broadcast? How do you prepare and how do you go? What's your mindset going into each broadcast? Well, my, my, my mindset is that, 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 um, you know, the race will not take care of itself, but I mean, people want to see the race. They want to see who wins. Okay. And it's one of the reasons that, you know, swimming at the Olympics, maybe it's because it's big blue water that everybody sees on their screen, but it's a nice color, but also at the same time, you got to win. Boom. Touch. Go. It's not like it's not like the basketball at the Olympics or gymnastics or whatever. It takes a long time to process. All right. Take your mark. Go. A minute later, you got a gold medal being given out, you know, and it's pretty easy to see what happens. So it's exciting. It builds really quickly. Right. So the race is going to kind of take care of itself. Excuse me. What people want to know is they want to know something about the athlete. And they want to know how come they won. You know, why did they win? You know, and so it so. I constantly do, you know, a couple of things to prepare for any broadcast. Um, But the biggest thing I do is I try to find out something about every single athlete. And this used to be much harder than it is nowadays, Amos. And the reason is there was no internet. And so the only way you could get to find out information about people was you actually had to be an international coach and travel. And luckily, I was on tours and teams and everything through the 70s and the 80s um, and the 90s. Um, and I would talk to other coaches and I would simply just watch the athletes. And sometimes I'd walk up to them and talk to them, you know, like the South Africans were, were really, you know, exciting at one particular point. Right. And so I got to know them. And as it turns out, small world, CBC sold the rights to our coverage at the Olympic games to South Africa and they played it in South Africa. So they all knew me. Right. And so that opened up an avenue for me to get more stories on them and find out where they lived and what they were doing. And. You know, and so that's, you know, that's it. Now, it, it, and so I had note cards. I kept note cards on every single athlete. Well, not every single athlete in the world, but probably about four or 500 of them. And then anytime there was I had a meet or I learned something new, I'd take out the note card and I'd write down something else and I'd get their birthday or whatever. And um, then you get to the Olympic Games and the athletes were lousy at filling out their bio forms. Every athlete's supposed to fill out a bio form when they get to the Olympic Games. And they were just lazy at it and they wouldn't do it. You'd hardly learn anything off of those. So it really wasn't much of an assist. Nowadays, because the athletes are swimming two or three quadrennials and their their personal profile is important and they're trying to put themselves out there to get more money or whatever it is, now they're a lot better at it, right? So their Olympic profiles and stuff are good. 
and their online presence. Everybody's got a Wikipedia page now. All right. Well, that's just an absolute goldmine for someone like me. Now, somebody's got to take the time and look at it. And um, there, you know, CBC doesn't really have a re researcher for swimming. They might have one for hockey, but you know, they don't have one for the sport of swimming. So I was pretty well on my own. Um, every once in a while, I could tap into some of the NBC stuff because they had four full-time researchers that they hired for the Olympic Games to just travel around the world and interview people. So sometimes I had some ins there and I could pull out some of their information. Um, you know, one time I found out that one of the girls that ended up winning a medal from France grew up in the Congo and she learned to swim in the Congo River. Well, I mean, we, how are you going to find that stuff out? But it's cool, right? When you hear it and you hear about it, right? I figured, well, she, she's from Toulouse. So I bet her dad worked for Air France and he got sent down there and that's exactly what it was, you know? And so it was kind of a neat story that I could put the bow on. So so now though, I just go on the internet. So on any any given day, on any given day, I will there's a there's two websites that basically are the Bible for swimming. Back in the day it was a magazine called Swimming World magazine. And of course I subscribed to that and I would take all the notes down and everything from the coverage of the meets. And now there's a swim there's a couple of websites. And so I'm I was on it twice today already writing down notes just little things you might i might not learn anything one day but then the next day i might find out that um you know the, the story that made me laugh a million times and i used it twice and i'll probably use it again if she makes the Olympic team for great britain it was during COVID. um abby wood's dad owned a, a trash collecting um, company trucks and she got so bored with the zooming fitness classes that she said to hell with it i'm gonna go out and help my dad so she walked behind the garbage truck, picking up the, the garbage bins, throwing them in the truck, and did that for six weeks. And she said, you know what? I got a newfound life for swimming. <laughs> I've been doing this for six weeks, you know? But that's a cool story, you know? And and so that's that's my job, I feel, is to try to get stories from the athletes. And I get a – it's a very small window. I There's some athletes I could talk for a half an hour on. But I've got basically from when they introduce their name – They've got until they walk to their lane. So I got about five to seven seconds to say something about Tommy or Billy or Susie or whatever. And then poof, then they say, and in lane number seven, I got the next athlete I've got to talk about. So it's a really small window, but I've got to try to get something on most everybody. And I don't, I don't want it just to be, oh, they're ranked third in the world. All right. Cause that, that's good. That's, that's, that may be relevant. And for some athletes, that's exactly what you want to say. But it's nice if you can say that. They just graduated with a human kinetics degree or, or, you know, they're, you know, they grew up 400 miles out in the bush in Australia. Right. And, and only did something because grandma had a pool in her backyard, you know, or something like that. So I want to enrich, if I can, the viewer. And I've had a lot of people tell me that they love watching swimming for many reasons. But one of them is that they identify with the athletes. Then they actually, we personalize them by telling them stories about them. And so that's good. And then if I have, you know, a little more about somebody, maybe if they win or do something at the end during the slow-mo, I can say something. Um, and maybe even when they're getting out of the water, sometimes the camera will be on the winner or the second placer or whatever. Again, so it's a snippet. It's 10 seconds. Because in the middle of the race, I'm not so sure I want to be talking about, you know, the kid carrying garbage bins behind her dad's truck, right? When, you know, you got this tight race for the gold medal, you know? Certain things you can throw in, but but certain things you have to be away. So so that's what it is. So it's constant work. It's 10, 20 hours every week, um, all year round. Um, that's tedious at times, I will admit, but but um, I like it. I like the fact that uh, I love being in the middle of the action. I got the best seat in the house right on the finish line. Um, and I'm selling my sport to the world, and and I really like that. So I think it works well, and I'm I'm glad that I have really good play-by-play -play guys. Obviously, Steve Armitage, and and I had Elliot Friedman, and and now Rob Snook is working with me, and um, those guys are so good at what they're doing. I mean, they got people talking in their ear all the time and telling them you got ten seconds to do this and ten seconds to do that, and uh, you know they're very good at, at setting the big picture. You know, here's here's the record, here's what we've done in the past, here's what these are expected. So I like working with them. That Their strength is that, and my strength is trying to, you know, get down to the nitty-gritty of, of the swimmers. And I think we've got a good pairing, and, and it works really well. Yeah, and I resonate a lot with what you just said there, a lot. I mean, even as as a play-by-play -play announcer myself, that's also 90% also of the things that I do also, for, even from a play-by-play -play perspective as well, because we're also trying to tell a story too, right? Yeah. S Scott Russell, who I've had on a previous episode of this podcast, also said that it's all about the stories that we tell and why it's relevant to the audience. And that's why, again, as you mentioned, 
so many people, when they come up to you, they, they say that they love watching swimming because they're able to relate to the athlete in at least one or more different areas. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's no different from the play by play perspective as well. For me, what I find is that depending on the sport, there's different pacings and tempos that I have to keep up with. So swimming for me, at least from the play by play perspective, it's a bit easier because all I have to do, at least from my own experience so far, is announce the announce the time, announce the world uh, the world record or the national records, and then just basically talk about what's happening on the pool. You know, yeah. the, the difference between the first between lanes lanes four and five typically because those are the fastest lanes in the pool, and just build off from there. So in the world of swimming, for swimming announcing as a play by play announcer, I feel like I have a bit of an easier job compared to what the color commentator like yourself has to do because you're doing all the analysis you're looking at things that the average person wouldn't be able to see but in sports like hockey or basketball there's a lot more happening that i have to talk about yeah especially for yeah i I can see that actually you're right yeah there's a the other sports are a little more dynamic right you know hockey player doesn't just skate on his own down the right wing and nobody touches him right he's got a deke he's got to do this somebody's going to do that some whatever he has a different shot or baseball pitcher's got five different pitches he can pitch or whatever you know what i mean so so it's a little bit different swimming is it's i wouldn't call it cut and dry but it's a little bit more straightforward because everybody stays in their own lane all right so it's uh you know it's uh, the difficulty of course becomes and i you know we it's a little it's better now than it used to be um but it's hard you've got eight lanes and it's like, well, second from the top, because viewer doesn't know what lane two is, you know? And so second from the top is lane two is, is Charlie, and, you know, he's going to make a move here. Watch this, you know, or lane four, lane five. So we're constantly trying to identify who it is you're looking at or the one in the yellow bathing cap or something to identify. Because, again, it's not even like track and field where the camera zooms in as they're running by and you can see their country or you can see their face, you can see the number. These guys, you know, other than the backstroke, you know, their face is in the water. You can't even see their face, Right. You know, we're basically cheering for a bunch of bums going up and down the pool, right? So, not bums in the derogatory sense. I mean, you know, they're the part of their body that you can see, right? So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. For me, speaking from the play by play sense, what I found is that if I'm able to find a pattern, then I usually stick with that pattern and I branch yeah. out from there. And I think hockey's a good, what... yeah. And hockey's a good example of that because there's only one puck. So, when you follow that puck around, then you're able to follow the action. And for me, I describe each action about three to four words max. That way I'm able to kind of not just follow the action, but raise the the the, the pacing of my speech, emphasize certain points, de-emphasize certain points, and play with the flow of the action just to guide the the viewer or the listener, depending on what they're tuning into, to guide them into what the action's happening. Right, and that's how I typically do it. In swimming, there it's no different to that. The pattern is well. First of all, from a very very simple surface level observation, everyone's going one direction, then the other direction, <laughs> yeah, so on right. and so forth. For me, I'm trying to play up again, again, like what's the time so far? Are they on record pace? Who's catching up? Who's slowing down? That sort of thing. But you know, I that's why it, it, there's always that bouncing off and conversation between myself and whoever my color commentator is. Yeah. And, you know, that kind of dynamic is very fascinating because and, and that's that's what brings me back to announcing each and every time. It's just so much fun for me. Yeah. But it's it's a fun thing to do. If you you know, it, if you can do it well, then it's it's really it's a lot of fun, right? And you get to see different things in different avenues and you know, and it, it's 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 um it's a bit of an adrenaline rush, no question about that. Um, you're trying to, you know, every once in a while I do get tongue tied, right? Because I'm trying to say so so much, and I I need to I need to I need to dumb it down a little bit. I need to try to not get quite as much said, you know. And there'll be another opportunity, you know. And nowadays, actually, it's it probably has more merit for the simple reason that. People are around for three Olympics, so you know someone like Sarah Schostrom coming to our fourth Olympic Games. I don't need to say everything about her in the last Olympic Games because I'm going to see her again, right? We're going to see her worlds. We're going to see her here, right? So it's it's one of those things where um, you've got to make it short and sweet, um, but still try to try to elucidate the best you can, right? And get it in there. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And adapting to each style of play-by-play announcers, such as Steve Armitage, Elliot Freeman, now Rob Snow, how do you how do you adapt to those styles? Because you know, to the average person. 
they may sound the same or similar, but you know, to you and to me, there's different styles that that, that are there. So how do you adapt to that, and how do you adapt the dynamic? Well, I, I, I mean, I think experience is a wonderful teacher, right? You know, for everybody, and and so, you know, it's it's really a kind of a question of what you try, whatever you you know, you do what you're used to doing. So uh, the first guy I worked with actually was Ted Reynolds, all right, and he wanted to introduce all the lanes, and I kind of felt that you know I knew more about the athletes, right, than just saying, oh, in lane five is is you know Amos Vang from uh, Ottawa, right? So so I switched that with Steve, and I started doing the lanes, you know. So and that's that that was a major change, to be honest, right? You know, but I thought it it added to the broadcast, and I think it still does. So now with Rob, we're going to start to change it just a little bit, and I'm going to do most of them. But we're going to have him come in every once in a while, so it's not like he's not part of that. So I think that's actually, you know, that was just a recommendation. You can still learn. I've been doing this for 40 years, but you know what? We got, that's make, that might make it a little bit better. We talked to some of the CBC, you know, coaches that coach will coach the uh, commentators, right? And and so I think that was that was a good idea. So we're going to do that a little bit more. So so I think you 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 learn as you go, um, and I think that uh, you know sometimes I'll go a little bit longer, and Rob won't mind that. Um, because I, I'm in the middle of the story. So rather than bailing into the turn and allowing him to cover the turn, maybe I'll go a little bit further, you know? And so we'll just kind of, kind of, how does it work? And if he feels comfortable letting me do that, or if he feel co- feels comfortable covering the whole race, a 50 takes 20 seconds, you know? So by the time he sets it and they hit the water, there's only 10 seconds left. Well, they're going to finish in eight seconds of that, right? So it's really, sometimes it's not worth me getting in. You know, and so I'll just uh, I'll just kind of go, you know, put my hands up like that, and he sees that, and he knows he should take it all the way in, and he's comfortable doing that. If he wasn't, then I would jump in. You know, so so you 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 need to have the ability to change, but at the same time, you start with a certain routine, and then you modify it a little bit. It's not going to be day and night differences, I'm sure you've experienced, right? But there might be you might be able to do some fine tuning; it'll pay off. So it's it's yeah. worth experimenting a little bit if you need to. You know, so yeah. Yeah, it's that fine tuning. It's it's the little things that really matter when it comes to announcing that I found and that and that you found as well in your experience. And it's also the big things as well because you know there are going to be record swimming. There are going to be record swims rather that will happen once in a while. Now, when I announced the 2018 U Sports Swimming Championships, Kylie was on a roll, sweeping every single backstroke event and knocking down record after record after record and. One of the things that I found that was difficult about announcing Kylie Swims was that when you get to that point, it's just so exciting. It's yeah. it's it's just it's such a, an adrenaline rush. And my style of announcing is I draw from the energy of the crowd. And swimming, especially being in the stands and being around, you know, everybody just loudly cheering. Oh my goodness! Like I, it was, it's almost like a sensory overload for me. Kylie Moss going ultra instinct or super saiyan right now as she's going down the last stretch. Can she make it in time? She is firmly in the lead. Last 12 and a half meters left to go. Can she reach that time? Oh my goodness, barely misses the Canadian record, but she breaks the U Sport record. 202.17 is her final time. Once again, a new U Sport record, and she wins this event. So. <laughs> Being able to announce and being able being able to take it down was so so difficult. I'm just like, oh my goodness! Like it's 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 going to be a record. It's like what's going on here, right? But let alone for you when it's at again. I'm going back to 2008 for this because when you were announcing Michael Phelps's male swims, and, and there were a couple where Michael was in second. I, I remember this. This was one of the butterfly events. It was uh, he was behind Michael Cavage. Yeah. And he was second the entire race. And then all of a sudden, at the very end, he gets the gold medal, gets the first touch. Yeah. So how do you maintain com- your composure with these kinds of swims? Because these are, I mean, I don't know if I would be able to handle it. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, I mean, they're historic, right? So, I mean, that one was a bit weird, to be honest, right? Because, uh, you know, that was his seventh, I think, gold medal, right? The relay was the next day uh, for his eighth gold medal. And um, that was the one that was going to be... The relay on day two was a bigger challenge, but the, the the French swimmers screwed up, and so the Americans were able to win the gold medal. So that was his biggest hurdle, but he was able to get that one. And then this was his second biggest hurdle. He knew it was going to be a tough one, the 100-meter butterfly. If it would have been a, a flat-out win easily, I think that's just um, that's more excitement because 
excuse me, because the whole second 50, you can start to say, and this will be his seventh. This will tie him with the record. This will, da, 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 as opposed to, oh my God, he might not win, right? So, so it wasn't probably as heightened, maybe. Um, and just for, you know, people that may not know what happened was, um, the young boy, Cabbage, well, not young, but he was in his early 20s, um, born and raised in L.A., but, but, but was uh, um, from uh, Europe. And so he swam for his home country, uh, or his parents' country, I guess you'd say. And he had the best swim of his life, by far. He did his best time by over a full second. And he was ahead the whole way, like you say. And he actually... When it finally got all, you know, there's nobody in the pool and nobody on the TV that thought Michael Phelps won that race because Cabbage came around and he was, but he was really in the sport of swimming, we call it dying towards the end of a race. He was really dying. He had such a big lead. Michael probably closed almost a body length in the last 10 meters and he barely got to the wall. Well, the problem is, you know, and we interviewed the Omega timing guy after, after the race, he said, swimming is the only sport where you must depress the finishing mechanism. You know, track and field, it's a camera. They see as you go by, cycling, it's a camera, all those things, right? Swimming, you must depress the touch pad, and you must exert, I believe it's 2.2 kilograms of pressure. Wow. Or 3 kilograms. I can't remember what it was, but it's in that area. And what happened is Cabbage was dying so bad that he actually did just get his fingernails on the touch pad, but he didn't depress it. Oh. Right? And Phelps came along. Hundreds, and we're talking hundreds again, right? Obviously, hundreds of seconds behind, but hit it with force. And so by the time Cabbage finally depressed the pad, Phelps had come around and touched it. And that's how Phelps won the gold medal. He actually didn't, in theory, touch the end wall first, but you're not given credit for touching until you depress the touch pad. So there, that was the story, all right? So it took us a while to figure that out, okay? All right, I mean, we're talking the race ended, and we're going, well, I can't believe, I mean, you know, Phelps wins these races by hundreds. He's very good at timing the wall, right? He even swam a race once with the goggles filled up with water and he timed because he knew he took 23 strokes. He took 23 strokes and he lunged for the wall and he hit it. I mean, that's how good this guy and how well-trained he was. But the point was that we're in a conundrum up in the timing booth because we, like everybody else, didn't think he won the race. And we, you know, we realized he did and it wasn't a timing malfunction or anything, but, but we couldn't get the timing guy to fully explain it for about 20 minutes. We finally got him to come up and we talked to him afterwards and he explained the whole the whole system behind it. So it was kind of a cool, cool thing that CBC was able to pull off, albeit 20 minutes later, but that's, you know, the only thing we could do. So, so yeah, so you, you can control it. I mean, obviously, you know, his eighth gold medal, he actually didn't even swim in the relay at night. He swam in the prelims in the morning. So that was uh, a whole different issue. And this goes, I'll tie this story in for you, Amos, okay? So this, again, is, is the ability to give background stories because you know people. So I was at a party on the, on a, the, whatever it was, the eighth night of swimming before the night, the ninth day, which was the next day, the relay, where Michael's going to win his eighth gold medal. And I'm at the party, I'm talking to people, and they said, so, can you believe that Michael is going to give up his spot on the relay and swim in the prelims and not in the finals? I said, pardon me? <laughs> He's going to do what? All right? So his big rival was a guy named Ian Crocker, and Crocker couldn't swim the prelims like he was supposed to, because he had the 53 final or something that, that in the, during the, when it was going to be swum. So Michael said, tell you what, Ian, I'll swim the prelims. You can have the finals. And Ian kind of goes, really? You know, now the beauty nowadays, of course, is if you swim the prelims for the team, you get the medal, they win at night as well. All right. So this is like a huge story because everybody and their mother is waiting for the finals of the four by one medley on the last night of swimming because Michael is going to establish history and win his eighth gold medal. Michael's not swimming. So I phoned CBC and said, I got a scoop for you guys. You need to get this on the air, right? Michael, I mean, I had to verify with two more people. I couldn't just go on the one guy saying it, right? So I finally talked to the medical doctor and he said, yeah, he's not going to swim and talked to his agent, and, you know, so he wasn't going to swim. So, so I said, you guys got to get this on air, right? So it's probably the biggest scoop I've ever had on air, right? I said, Michael's not going to swim the final. He's only going to swim in the preliminaries. So the beauty was that the United States didn't announce it I don't even know if that ends at that night. I think they announced it in the morning. So there were people flocking to the pool because this is going to be Michael's last swim, you know? So so we had to hype that a little bit. But so. you can't have fake bravado, though, all right? You've got to, you know, if it's an exciting race, it's an exciting race. If it's not exciting, it's not exciting, you know? And you've got to bring it down a little bit of a level, you know? And so that's something, 
that I think commentators learn to do over time. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that I've learned over time over the the, the roughly 10 or years, 10 or so years of experience that I've that I've done. When I first started announcing, and it's even the, the same thing now, whenever you're applying for you know comment new commentary positions you'll find that a lot of producers when they look at they don't look for you just calling the goals or calling the record breaking <laughs> swims or the record breaking runs or so on and so forth they're trying to hear how you handle the mundane plays so to speak but yeah, yeah. the regular plays the plays that don't really go anywhere they're looking for that kind of pacing when they're going for so if you're able to handle a regular so-called mundane play, then you're definitely going to be able to handle a goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and and that's that that's such an important thing that I think, and I mean, I think anybody who wants to go into sports casting of any kind has to remember, it's it's how you handle just the everyday kind of things, the everyday kind of plays. And for me, that goes back to what I was talking about when it comes to tempo and pacing, because there are certain points that are exciting. Like you mentioned, exciting points where yeah. you want to bring up the the excitement, but there are also points where they're just mundane, so you don't want to overhype it, right? Yeah. So it's that kind of, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw a little bit from my musical background as a, as a piano, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, in classical piano, there's there's phrasing, right? There's musical phrasing, there's yeah. dynamics, there's there's question and answer, a melody harmony, and that sort of thing. So there are there's it's not know, all Beethoven's fifth. You know, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so it's like there's the climax. I mean, to use, um, you know, as simple terms as I possibly can, there's the climax. And then there's also like the, the denouement or the the decrease in action. Right. So and as a pianist or as a musician in general, you have to interpret that in a way that makes sense. Otherwise, people are going to be like, you're just playing loud the whole time. You're just playing soft the whole time. What's going on here? Same thing in, an in announcing. And, you know, it's and you've mastered it so well and then after all these years watching the olympics for on my end and you know hearing your your announcing i mean there's a reason why many people defer to you as the encyclopedia of swimming because not only do you know your stuff but you're able to articulate it in a way that frankly few other announcers are able to do right and that's why i think you know it, the cbc is very very fortunate to have you as an asset for them because of that experience Let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're only, I wouldn't say you're only as good as your last show, but but there's a bit of truth in that, right? You know, like, um, you know, I, I go into every show feeling like I have to prove myself. I mean, arguably after 45 years, I shouldn't, but, mm. but I feel like that. And I think that's probably what helps me do a good job is that, you know, I, I work just as hard on this show as I, uh, as I did the one 20 years ago or whatever, you know, maybe even even harder nowadays, right? Because there's so many more outlets out there for information and stuff. So, um, but the key to, to the key to being a good broadcaster is obviously you have to have knowledge, but you know, you've got to do research. If you're, not, if you're just winging it and you don't have any research, it, it's not going to work. You know, I mean, I enjoy, I enjoy listening to the Blue Jays broadcast right now because I, I feel Don Shulman and Buck Martinez it just adds so much to the broadcast, you know. Now there's a hell of a lot of dead time in baseball, right? <laughs> okay, so so it, it helps, you know. I think the fact that you know Buck used to play and stuff and manage, but but I just think that you've got to be able to fill that airtime, you know. And and we do have, you know, there, there's there are races in swimming, particularly if we do the preliminaries, you know, that's three hours of something going nowhere, you know. Like you know, there's not a lot. Of, there's a little bit of excitement, but boy, it's nothing like a final race, you know. So you've got to be able to then. Then you've got to be able to put perspective on what's happening, you know. So what are they trying to do here, Byron? What's what's happening, you know? Not a, you know, like a, you know, the the play by play guy will still sort of set the tone, but then I've got to sort of say, well, what are they trying to accomplish? You know, are they going hard? Are they going easy? Are they backing off? And what's this person trying to accomplish over in lane two? And is there a different methodology? Like, you can then actually get into it a little bit more than just the race because the race isn't quite as important in the preliminaries necessarily. So all the different things you got to do, yeah. right? So, yeah. But again, I gotta be good. I gotta be on my toes for every race I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a, I have the same feeling as well. I think this is a very natural feeling amongst most broadcasters. It's that for me, at least, I always feel like I always treat each broadcast as if it's my last. You know. Yeah. So you know, I think that that kind of feeling is very common across many broadcasters. At least those who want to do their best and do a good job on on a broadcast. So. 
So uh, absolutely, I, I resonate with you on that point. And that leads me to another point that I also wanted to talk about. You, having been in swimming for so long and having seen so many things that have happened, both as a coach and as a broadcaster, and also in your early days competing, there are going to be so many people who have misconceptions about the sport of swimming. What are the biggest ones that you have seen? Well, it's, it's, it's ebb and float, right? And you'll, you'll kind of laugh at, with, at this maybe, um, is that before Ben Johnson, you know, infamous Canadian runner, right, that tested positive, which in essence he kind of got screwed because I think everybody was on something back then. But anyway, before that, when you would say, uh, oh, you know, oh, you went to the Olympics, oh, do you win a medal? That was the general consensus. You go to a party, you go anywhere, people say, oh, did you win a medal? Right? Well, Canada was winning a lot of medals, particularly swimming back then. Um, and so it seemed like, oh, it must be easy. Everybody must win medals, you know? And nobody seemed to have a feel for how hard it was to actually win a freaking Olympic medal or a Commonwealth medal or anything. And so my, my pet peeve was that nobody, they just didn't think it was a big deal, right? They just, oh, you go out there, you try really hard and you win, you know? And after Ben Johnson and the big, huge inquiry that they had, all right, where they got down to the nitty gritty of what the training was they were doing and how they were involved and how they knew what the world was doing and obviously the, the whole steroid regime that he was on, but I mean, everything that they were doing, I'd go to parties and stuff after that and I'd say, yeah, I'm coaching somebody. I think he's going to make the Olympic team. They said, that's amazing. It was never like, oh, are they going to win a medal? All right? They understood all of a sudden now it's amazing to actually get to that level as opposed to just taking for granted, oh, it's easy to do if you work hard. Well, no, it's not. A lot of people work hard and they don't get there. You know? so, uh, so to me, that was sort of my, my biggest pet peeve was that, that, that people didn't understand how much work it took to get to the top levels. And now, you know, I think I'm, it's it's sort of like, I guess, the downside of success. We're now starting to win. Canadian swimmers are now starting to win a lot more medals with Penny Alexiak and now young superstar Summer McIntosh that I think people are starting to say, oh, you made the Olympics. You're going to win a medal? Well, no, not everybody wins medals, all right? Like it's, yeah, you know, but a lot of people have recently, you know? So that's, it's going to, you know, maybe it's, you know, what is it? History repeats itself. Maybe we're going to find out that people are going to not quite understand how hard. I, there's a little more information out there, so maybe they will understand it a little bit better, right? But um, that was probably the biggest misunderstanding I felt um, about uh, about the sport. Um, so I think everybody kind of understands how hard the swimmers work compared to all the others. I know the other athletes know. The track and field people think we're nuts, um, you know, training so much. Um, because, you know, basically track and field, the races are – you know, um, four times faster or whatever, like a, 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 a hundred, uh, four, a 440 or a 400 meter guy is more like a hundred meter swimmer, you know, well, hundred meter swimmers train three to four hours a day. The track guys don't run four hours a day. Okay. I mean, they're, they're, they're obviously their knees would fall off and their thighs and everything. They'd have more injuries. So, but they just can't fathom how hard the, the, the swimmers actually train. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think a lot of those misconceptions were also erased or for the most part, you know, elim uh, suppressed when 2016 came around, right? Especially here in Canada, where we just had standout performances. I mean, Penny Oleksiak, perfect example of that. But there, were, but the rest of the team were, was also really, really good that year. Yeah. So, no, it was it, 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 instead of winning for six or seven Olympics, we only won one or two medals in the pool, you know? So it must be hard. Right. Well, now all of a sudden we're winning six medals. And because a couple of those were relays, well, then you have four or five people that are on those relays, like four people at night. And maybe you substitute one or two for the morning. So you got five or six kids that are getting Olympic medals. So you come home and yes, the country won six, but 15 kids actually came home with an Olympic medal or more, more than one. Right. So that's, that's, a, that's a big group. There's a lot of clubs that have it, a lot of everything. But you know what? It's it's. um it's good. It's a good problem to have, right? You know, that everybody thinks it's easy to win medals. It's not, right? So, but, you know, we're, we're going to continue to strive to to do better, I guess. So. Yep. And with everything that, that you've done in the world of swimming, there's going to be so many rewarding moments that you've done over the years. Actually, yeah, let me mention one more thing, okay? I guess the, my other pet peeve is that swimmers toil in obscurity, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, like... You know, even even someone like a Kylie Moss doesn't have a lot of endorsements or whatever, right? If she was in Europe, she'd have a ton, right? You know, um, 
So elite international athletes, particularly swimmers, and even to a certain extent in the United States, um, maybe not the guy that's, you know, wins a gold medal or whatever, right? But but they really toil in obscurity because they're not football, they're not basketball, they're not ice hockey. Um, you know, and I, there's other sports that I'm, I'm sure are pretty similar. Even track and field, there's a lot more notoriety. They have the Diamond League. They have all these other things going on where the athletes make a lot more money. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars, all these athletes, millions for a lot of them, right? Way more than the swimmers. Probably to a, I would argue that it's a tenfold increase in track versus swimming versus the amount of income that they can make and their notoriety, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's a little bit of a problem. It was a great line by a speed skater, weight, uh, speed skater slash, I think she, um, uh, what did she do? She did something else as well. All right. Um, speed skating was her main stroke, where it was her main sport, but it was Bonnie Blair was her name. She won a whole Wanko Olympic gold medals. And after one winter Olympics ended, they interviewed her and said, so what are you going to do now? And she's, you know, to prepare, you know, like for the next Olympics or whatever. And she said, well, I'm going to go into witness protection for three and a half years. And then you guys will trot me out before the Olympics starts for the next Olympic Games. And you know what? That's kind of like swimmers. All right. They kind of out of sight, out of mind. And we'll bring you out for the Olympic Games and we'll talk about you and everybody will get real excited. And then you'll disappear for four years. Um, and then we'll trot you out again for the next Olympic Games. So I guess that's my other pet peeve is they're, they're great athletes. They're incredible. Um, you know, like I like to try to tell somebody, if you were the fifth best accountant in the world, I think you'd probably be pretty famous. You're certainly earning a hell of a lot of money, right? Or the fifth best lawyer, or the seventh best, you know, heart surgeon or something, right? Whereas if you're the fifth best swimmer, yeah, nobody really knows who you are, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so that's a that's a downside to our sport. One that we all take for for granted. We understand that, you know, it, it happens, and uh, we're fine with it. But it's just, it's, too, it's unfortunate that the kids don't get a little more credit. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking as a lawyer myself, th there's literally publications every year on best lawyers, literally called <laughs> best lawyers. And especially, you know, Toronto has, has, you know, Bay Street and all like the, the lifestyle, ooh, you know, Toronto all, all, and whatever. And they, I mean, all the intentions, like all, the, the, when, when, when you, when you've quote unquote made it, you're getting a lot of attention. But like, as you mentioned in swimming, like, it just doesn't, you know, doesn't have no, no. thing within this little, you know, within this little circle, people will respect you and understand who you are and have a, you know, like you do have your kudos in your little circle, right? But you know, you're world level athlete, and people just don't aware of it. But yeah. that's the way. So you ask for me a pet peeve, that's my pet peeve. Yeah, no, <laughs> it, and 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 that that's just one of the things that is unfortunate because you know different countries have different cultures for sport. You know, Canada obviously is hockey. Yes. And maybe lacrosse, but more so hockey. You know, America, the U.S. has American football. Europe has, uh, well, association football or soccer. Yeah. And Australia has swimming. Australia has swimming, exactly. And I would, and in some Asian circles, depending on where you go, sport isn't even a thing. It's actually music. Classical music is the big thing. Right. So like if you want, like, I mean, as a person of Chinese descent, a Canadian born Chinese, you know, if I talked about sports more often than not, it's not actually the popular thing. If I talk about my music background, people are like, oh, tell me more about it. So it's that kind of cultural issue that I think it, it's very difficult to change that. As you said, it's uh, it is what it is. Um, but we can do what we can to kind of boost the the presence. But that's also why it helps that you know, athletes do well in what they do because that, that boosts the presence. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. And, but it's still a very rewarding experience for, for you for all these decades. So what do you find are the most rewarding aspects as a coach, as a broadcaster, what are your favorite moments and the most rewarding moments that you found so far? All right. Um, well, favorite moments are a little different maybe than the rewarding ones, right? The favorite moments are the ones that are, pretty, pretty special, unique Olympic moments. Uh, usually it's, I would argue it probably is the Olympic moments more than the Commonwealth or any of the other meets that I've televised. Um, but one of them, you know, one of the, the first Olympics that I did was 1984 um, because 1980 was canceled. I would have done that, but obviously we didn't, nobody went, right? We didn't go to Moscow. So 1984 was in LA and Alex Baum and Canada had not won an Olympic gold medal in swimming in 72 years. So, and, and I knew Alex, I knew Alex very well. Um, I recruited him. I didn't quite get him to come to school, but <laughs> so um, 
Well, he's a smart guy, but um, but he won a gold medal on the second second day of, of swimming in the 400 meter individual medley, and it was just it was like a, a, a pent up like oh my god, Canada's getting a gold medal finally in the sport of swimming, and it was just so special. And he broke the world record. I mean, it was just it was it was great, and there was a little push at the end by the by the Brazilian, so it kind of uh, got a little bit dicey towards the end, but he still won, and um, so that was a really big moment, and and probably the other one more international in flavor that, that came along was um, the 4x100 freestyle relay in Sydney, Australia. And the reason was that at this point, I'm trying to think, I think the Americans had never lost, had never lost the 4x100 freestyle relay. And it was in Australia. And the Australian, of course, take their swimming phenomenally seriously. And the Americans had said when the local populace and the local media had said, well, the Aussies think they can give you a run for the gold medal. And the American guy, Gary Hall was his name, said, oh, yeah, no chance. We're going to play them like a guitar. All right? And then when he mimicked that he was, you know, going to play a guitar. Well, that's the old adage. Don't give somebody the locker room talk for the bulletin board, right? The Aussies got keener and keener and keener. And, I mean, it just, it was, it was uh, the stars aligned. Because the same night of that race was the 400 meter freestyle, and Ian Thorpe, who became a gigantic star in Australia, I mean, he's still a he's still a household name down there, and he hasn't competed in what 20 years. So um, he won the 400 meter free, broke a world record, beat everybody by a body length and a half or whatever. And then he came back half an hour, or whatever it was, an hour later, and, and anchored the relay against Gary Hall, the guy that said the quote. Well, the Aussies were pumped. Their, their leadoff men broke the world record for the individual leg of the first 100 meters. And Thorpe caught Gary Hall, passed him at the end, outtouched him, and the Aussies won the gold medal. The place went berserk, absolutely berserk. It was exciting. It was incredible. You, you couldn't have asked for a more important victory for Australia, for their Olympic Games and their home soil. And I don't think they were even allowed to do this, but the guy in charge of the music for the pool because you're not supposed you're not supposed to be biased for your country, you know, right? When you're doing this, he put the song on. I come from a land down under, and the place started singing it at the top of their lungs. Is my recollection like it was? It was magical. It really was magical. So magical that Thorpe lost the next day in the 200 free because I don't think he could come down from the high. Like here we are, the guy, the world record, he's an amazing guy, and he was even so caught up that he lost the next day. It was, it was like a catastrophe. Nobody could believe it, but I could understand it because he was just so caught up. So anyway, those are, those are the, the, the magical moments, basically. Um, the, the rewarding, the rewarding is, is um, I, different than swimming and track and than um, swimming than, than commentating. Um, the rewarding parts are, are just, are seeing the joy on, on people's faces when they succeed. It's, I mean, we have a long season. This isn't, you know, volleyball or basketball where every game is an important game. So you win so many, you get into the playoffs or, you know, you have a really good game and score 50 points. The next game, you only score 30 in basketball or whatever. We don't, we just have some benchmarks, but we don't have really important meets until that one meet at the end of the year. And so it's a long haul to get to that point. And then when you get to that point and you do succeed and do your best time, which is 99% of the time, that's the goal. It's a, it's a joy, and, and you can just see it on the athlete's face. You can see how they, they, they're pleased with themselves. They're pleased that they've accomplished their goal. And I just love seeing that joy. And it, and it doesn't necessarily be the Kali Mas that wins the gold medal. You know, it can be, you know, one of the happiest guys I've ever seen in my life was my first year coaching at York University. This guy could hardly swim. I mean, he really was not a swimmer. And he'll tell you that to your, you know, now, all right? I'm not belittling this guy. Like, he was not a swimmer by any stretch. But he worked his ass off to get under a certain barrier and he made it under a minute, you know, which is a really pretty easy thing to do for anybody in the, in the sport. I didn't think he finished 36th out of 38 guys in the race. But the point was, he was ecstatic. He got under that barrier. You know, he dropped his best time by four or five seconds or something. So, you know what, that kind of joy is, is really what the rewarding is about. And, of course, then when they move on to certain other aspects in their life and they use sort of their swimming knowledge and, you know, some people who are um, – well, no, Catherine McKenna, she was the Minister of Environment under Tudor Trudeau's cabinet first time around. And now she works in some in some nonprofit areas. But um, she says that, uh, and I, I see her quite regularly when she blows into town. And she said that the stuff she learned in swimming is exactly how she was able to win her election 
and get elected to parliament. And it, it drove her for the things that she was trying to accomplish. Like all the discipline, all the training, everything that she needed to do, she learned in the sport of swimming. And so that's gratifying and, and you know, nice to hear when you, when you see that there's been a success that you've learned from that. So those are the rewarding things that I, 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 I like to see. Yeah, that's great. And I guess in commentating, to... commentating, the rewarding thing is if, if, if we hear that people like the broadcast, I mean, you know, like, and, 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 okay, and here's a good one. Um, I like to hear it from my friends in Detroit, in Buffalo, and Seattle when they say, yeah, we watch your broadcast. We don't watch NBC, all right? Because you guys are better. And that, uh, you know, for a tenth of the budget, probably, that's a pretty damn good show we're putting on the air, right? And kudos to our sound guys, our lighting guys, our camera guy, everybody. They're all doing it. It isn't just me, right? It's all the other guys. Like, we're putting on a hell of a show. Scott Russell and, you know, and Mission Control, I mean, all these guys. It's it's a it's a hell of a good show, and when I hear it from those guys on the border states, they're picking up our coverage. That's pretty cool. That's that's good, yeah. And you know, you hear from me, it's it's a it's good coverage, even from from my end as well. So you know, I I enjoy it too. So, <laughs> where do you see yourself five years from now? Same old, same old. All right, you know, I will be getting near the end then, though. I got I, I got to think. All right, so I mean, that'll be. I've said all along, I'll go, well, not all along. At one point I said, I, well, at one point I was going to have to retire, you know, 10 years ago because there used to be a mandatory retirement at 65. Obviously they waived that. Thank God. All right. So um, then I said, okay, I'll go till 2024. Well, then as I realized that was coming, once I, I think 2020 hit, I said, nah, I'm having too much fun. I'm not going to do that. So now I've basically said, I'm going to, I'm going to aim for 2028 at the earliest, but it, it, I don't know how much longer I'll go after that. Right. You know? For the broadcasting, I've said if they'll keep me, then I'll, I'd like to finish in LA because I started in LA. So that would make that would kind of be a nice full circle in broadcasting, all right? So so that would be the plan for broadcasting coaching. I may not go past 2028, but I might. I don't know, all right? But I'm certainly going to go till at least that. That'll be my 50th year of coaching at U of T. So that'll be kind of special as well. So. I mean, you will set a record of your own at that point. So. I know. I, think, I don't think anybody else will coach for 50 years. Maybe, they're, maybe nobody's stupid enough to want to coach that long. I mean, I, I don't mind working a 50, 60 hour week in coaching, right? Like a lot of people think it's stupid. They want to go, see, I don't golf. I don't have hobbies, right? So, you know, my hobby is, you know, like today, we're at, well, the season doesn't start till Tuesday, you know? but I worked on swimming stuff for three hours today. So I just, you know what? I like it. It's fun. So Exactly. I mean, there's an old saying where if you enjoy everything, if you enjoy work, it doesn't feel like you're even going to work at all. No, no, I don't think like I've ever worked a day in my life, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. I love what I'm doing. I absolutely love it. And I probably would have done it for no pay, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. So glad to hear that you're going to be still around for the next uh, several years or so. And as yeah. we begin to close this episode, what would you like to say to those who are considering the pursuit of a swimming career in any way, whether it's competitive, broadcasting, coaching? What's your advice? Um, okay, well, there's three different levels to that. The first one is if you want to get involved in a swimming career, do it in a heartbeat. It's a wonderful, wonderful sport. Um, number one, you can obviously do it till you're 90, all right? You can swim forever, and any doctor will tell you it's probably better than a lot of other sports as you get older because there's no real um, uh, pounding of the joints, you know, like running or, or other sports might might uh, have a pro you might have a problem with. So, um, and, and the other part about swimming that's so good, uh, and I and – I, you know, kiddingly tell people this, but there's a bit of truth to it, is that, you know, we keep the swimmers off the internet and off their phone four hours a day. And there's probably nothing else that does that. So I think that's, by default, it's a real plus. But more seriously, is the people in the sport of swimming are very good people. And not that people in other sports aren't good or anything, but there are very good people that I've come across and I feel that they're sort of upwardly mobile, um, goal-oriented people. And, you know, almost all of them are going off to university. So they're gonna, they, they realize the value of education. They're going to get a good education. They're almost all of them to a fault, not to a fault, to a, to a person, are good students. They're brought up being good students. And so I think that that is going to do them really well in the long run. And so for that reason, I think the sport of swimming has a lot, a lot going for it. And, you know, you meet great people in it, right? In terms of coaching, 
My first comment is a very funny one because this is what my coach told me. He said, don't coach. He said, you know what? He goes, it's great, but you're looking at the best situation possible. And what I mean by that is, you know, I was looking at his job and I thought that was a great job, right? And people are looking at my job. I think this is fantastic, you're at U of T, you know, you got all these people you recruit well, you got a pool, you got all these great athletes and people, but you may not start out there. In fact, you won't, you know, you're gonna have to start somewhere. So there's two or three giant roadblocks that you're gonna come across. And number one is you're gonna have to move because you're not gonna be able to stay in the same city probably um, to coach because you're gonna have to take opportunities. You know, um, so you may end up, you know, most of the coaches that I know, they've had three or four or five different jobs. I'm very lucky. I moved once down the Allen Expressway, right, in Toronto. I mean, it was nothing, you know. But everybody else that I know, even the national level coaches that I know very well, you know, they started in Montreal, went to Edmonton, went to Vancouver. Right? The other guy started in Montreal, went to Vancouver. The other guy started in uh, Toronto, went to Regina, went to Winnipeg, went back to Toronto. Like, you're going to move, right? It might just be Newmarket to Windsor to Toronto to Hamilton. Like you are going to move. And that's something that some people don't want to do. And nowadays, you know, again, this dates me, but a lot of times spouses didn't work in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. It was easy to move because they were on side with their husband's job. Well, that's not the case anymore, right? Spouses have their job and their important things in their life. So you may not be able to move, in which case then you're going to be stuck at that job in wherever it is upper rubber boot, Manitoba, and you're never going to be able to leave. And and that's going to be a problem for your coaching career, probably. Okay. So that's, 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 you know, those, that's one of the big roadblocks. The other, the other roadblock to being a coach is that you got to realize that you're kissing most of your weekends goodbye. So, and, and, and that's the reality. You race on the weekends. There's no swim meets during the week. You race on the weekends and swim meets aren't a volleyball game that takes, you know, get there an hour before, warm up, play an hour game, and you go home. Swim meets are five hours in the morning and five hours in the evening. They are all day and they are Saturday and Sunday. All right. I'm painting a bleak picture here, but it's not that bleak. Right. So, so I mean, there's lots of joy and everything else, but it's a lot of weekends. And so basically, you need a spouse that's going to agree with that. Um, and sometimes you coach till seven o'clock at night. So you're not home till 7 30. So you don't necessarily see your kids as much as if you have a normal job that finishes at five o'clock. And you certainly don't see them from, you know, morning, morning breakfast because you're, you're at the pool at five o'clock in the morning, right? So, so yeah. So you know what? You don't get as many nights out. Um, you don't get as many weekends. Um, you don't see your kids as much, but it's a great sport. You know, um, I love it. Uh, if you like it and you're good at it, and you know what? Some people are born to be good coaches. You know, yeah. if they're born to be a good coach, you may, you know what? It's not a nine to five job. It's kind of cool. You know, you get to travel a bit. I mean, if you get really good, you get to travel a lot. Um, but um, you know what? It's uh, I'm not so sure I could have been good in a sedate job. I like moving around. And uh, there's a real beauty to being able to do that. And arguably, as much as sometimes parents are a little bit of a pain in the ass, if you're coaching high school level kids, university is much better. They're pretty all burned out by that point. <laughs> um, most of the time, they're pretty good people. And if that's the case, then you can kind of do what you want. Like nobody's telling you how to coach the kids. Like you are, you are the master of your destiny. You get to, you get to design the workouts, the training, the meet schedule, where you're going. It's all on you. And, um, you know, it's a little brutal at times because you don't get feedback if you're selling insurance. You don't get feedback if you're, I guess I suppose a lawyer gets feedback if they're in a case and they lose a case, right? But, um, but, but in swimming, you're, you're getting feedback at every single meet, you know, and, and that feedback is for you. But it's also your peers. They're watching. Are your kids swimming well? Are they not swimming well? So, you know, it's a pretty, it's a stressful, but it's kind of a cool stress. You got to, you got to show up. You got to do your job. So, so that would be my advice. And then commentating. Well, the problem now in commentating is that when I, when I offered to do it, there was one other person who was interested. When I stepped down, the world would be, be a little, probably be about 3,000 people that are interested oh, in doing yeah. it. It's, it's a big deal now. There, you know, obviously there was no TSN or, you know, Sportsnet or anything like that back in the day. You know, there was this, yeah. you know, World of Sports or whatever. And even I, I don't even know if CBC had Sports Weekend right off the bat, you know. So so there wasn't as there wasn't as much, um, number one. Number two, the athletes were all retiring early. They were retiring in their, you know, late teens, early 20s. So they actually didn't have that much experience. And so there wasn't as much that they could actually provide or 
they weren't necessarily mature enough to handle it, I guess would be the word. Um, and there weren't as many jobs, right? So now there's some jobs, but not really in the sport of swimming, right? Yeah, so yeah. more in, you know, there's obviously more in hockey and all that, but so, so you're going to have to, if you want to be, be involved in the sport of broadcasting, you are going to have to do your research. And what I mean by research is you're going to have to figure out how to do a good job. You're going to have to rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. You're going to have to probably volunteer um, to get your chops. I mean, kind of like the, you know, the actresses, you know, Drake didn't become a star because he woke up one morning and said, I'm going to be a star. He was on Degrassi, if I remember correctly. Okay. So he was on TV. All these kids, all the, I can't remember their names, right? But the ones who were on the Mickey Mouse Club or whatever the hell, they all became superstar actresses, you know? And so, you know, you don't just wake up and say you're going to be good. You know, you've got to rehearse and work and work and work. And one of the reasons I probably got the job was I phoned up CBC and said, I hear you guys leaving. Could I borrow some tapes? Well, no, could I actually interview for the job? And could I borrow some tapes and rehearse? Hmm. And later, after I got hired, the guy in charge, the vice president at the time, said, you were the only guy that asked that question right. to rehearse so you could get better. So yeah. I knew you were going to be keen and you would you would do the job and you do it properly, right? So yeah. so that's my advice if somebody wants to get involved in that. And and again, the the downside they got to understand is that you're not going to jump in and be the play-by-play guy in the Maple Leafs hockey game on Saturday yeah. night, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And yeah. so you're going to have to understand that you're going to be covering, you know, smaller places. You're going to be working weekends. Mm-hmm. And if you want to be the talking head on TV, right, for on ESPN or, on, you know, Sportsnet or whatever, mm-hmm you're not going to be home ever before midnight. Okay. I mean, mm-hmm. you're going to, because if you want to, if you want to succeed, you want to probably be on the, the primetime show at night. And that means you're never getting home before midnight. So if you have a family, that's a hell of a problem. So, mm-hmm. you know, there are some challenges if you want to get into the business full time. Yeah. Maybe there's some part-time stuff, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, even from my own personal experience, it's, you know, I, I, you know, what you said is still the reality now. It's, it's even more competitive now, you know, and that's why I, even in my personal life, I've always, whenever my friends or colleagues tell, ask me about, you know, my time announcing, I always tell them that I'm so fortunate to have been, to still be doing it in some capacity after all these years, because, you, yeah. know, for, you know, as a bit of a background for me, I didn't come from a journalism background. You know, I can't, I did my undergrad at Carleton in a Bachelor of Arts in Law. Like I was strictly focused on trying to get into law and I did end up becoming a lawyer. But I had no journalism or communications background. So I was very, very fortunate to have had an in with the guys at Carleton, with the Carleton Ravens, doing PA announcing. And then later on, I did play-by-play for their hockey. And then I ended up doing, for them, I think around five sports. And today I've done a total of about eight sports, coming to nine sports now. Cool. But, you know, it's really like when you mentioned that advice of getting those tapes and yeah. really rehearsing them, that's essentially what I did. Now, of course, nowadays we don't use tapes. Now we use all streaming. <laughs> but that's how I started out. Like I, I watched a ton of hockey games, a ton of basketball games, a ton of soccer games. When I started doing swimming, when, when you brought me my first broadcast in swimming, I watched a ton of swimming events, read yeah. articles upon articles. I, I lived and breathed whenever I wasn't living and breathing law i was living and breathing sports right yeah. so that is you know and, and, and you know it's, it's kind of similar to how i approach music you know if you know if i'm not i'm also living and breathing music whenever i practice and you know play piano yeah. and perform back in the old days but yeah there's a lot of work it's not difficult it's not easy it's just voluminous you know it's just a lot of things you have to put together so you know great great advice and it, it hasn't it hasn't changed at all. It's still, if anything, it's even more difficult now. I can probably count on probably one hand the number of opportunities there are, even at the local level, honestly, let alone, yeah. you know, at the Olympics. No, everybody, Olympics. everybody wants, hey, <laughs> sports dynamic. It's yeah. not nine to five. It's not sedate, right? Like yeah. it is really dynamic thing. If all you got to do is go to a game that's exciting or, you know, go to a playoff game or something, right? You know, yeah. and, or go to the Olympics, you know? Yeah. You know, my son just asked me, he says, uh, yeah, you're going to be done. Can I go come? I said, well, you can come, but you're gonna have to pay a thousand dollars a night for the hotel room, probably, and you're gonna probably not get any tickets. Like, I don't have access to tickets, right? You know, like <laughs> people just don't realize. They understand it's cool, but it's there's a lot that goes into it, right? Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So there's a there's a lot of people out there that want to do it because it's dynamic, it's fun, it's great. There are you know there are challenges like in any any job, um, and like I said, evenings particularly that's what sports all about. So mm-hmm. you do have to be happy with that, and there's a lot of people that. Yeah. kind of wake up after a while and go, yeah, you know what? Maybe that's not what I want to do. And, 
and there's a lot of moving parts too with every broadcast. So oh um, Jesus, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now it's uh, it's amazing. And then you know what? The ones that are good at it get you know, experience as a great teacher. Just unfortunately, in in the business, in show business, basically, all right, you can't make a lot of mistakes. All right. Mm. Like, oh, like you, you know, yeah. Experience is a great teacher, but if you screw up, you, you, there is there's really not room for a lot of screw ups. You know, mm. and so you gotta you gotta be pretty top of your game all the time. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's you know, it's I, you know, there's no real secret to that. You just gotta. Some people are born to do it, you know. So and some people aren't. So that's the name of that. Absolutely, great advice. You know, great advice. Great broadcaster and a great coach. You know, Byron, thank you so very, very much for being here, you know, and sharing your experiences. And and I, I think our audience is going to be very happy to have heard the very living legend of Byron yeah. McDonald. All right, and thanks very much. We'll talk to you soon, I'm sure. Thank you. And thank you. And thank you also to our audience for tuning in to This is the Legend of on this particular episode. That was Byron McDonald head coach of the University of Toronto and longtime Olympic broadcaster for CBC Sports. You can find out more about him on the U of T website as well. And, you know, tune in to his broadcast whenever there is a broadcast on CBC as well. Thank you once again for tuning in this episode. Be sure to visit our website and follow us on our social media. And if you want, donate to us as well on our page, our PayPal as well. And once again, thank you very much for tuning in. Signing up for now, signing off for now. This is Amos Vang. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay legendary. <laughs>